Well, good morning and welcome to the 15th meeting of the Economy, Energy and Fair Work Committee for 2019. May I ask everyone present to turn electrical devices to silent so as not to interfere with proceedings. The first item on the agenda is a decision on taking business in private, that is items three and four. Is the committee agreed on that? Yes. Thank you. Um, we turn now to our session on the Scottish National Investment Bank Bill, which is item two on the agenda. And we have with us today uh, a number of witnesses. I'll start first from my right. Uh, Benny Higgins, who is the strategic advisor for the establishment of the Scottish National Investment Bank. Paul Brewer and also Alan McFarlane, and the latter two are both former members of the advisory group on the implementation plan for the SNIB, as I think we call it in short. So, um, welcome to all three of you. Thank you for coming in this morning. And uh, perhaps I can just start with a question about the, the implementation plan, and just wonder if you could explain um, one of you, I think possibly Benny Higgins might be the one to do this. Uh, what went into developing the implementation plan and also whether the, the 21 key recommendations uh, are adequately reflected in the bill that is before Parliament? So perhaps if I can start with Benny Higgins. Okay, um, I'll start with well, t the two, two parts to the question. And on the former, we had a uh, reasonably large advisory group drawing um, skills and experience from various uh, uh, parts of the Scottish kind of economy and business sector. We all, all also had Mariana Matsukato on board as one of the key advisors. Of course, her work on mission-related patient capital investment is a key part of the work that we pursued. Um, but more importantly, I think we had a very um, large number of sessions with um, different participants and actors across um, the, uh, if you like, the, the ecosystem within Scotland. I personally sat through a large number of dinners, breakfast meetings and other sessions where we attracted a huge number of people to ensure that we listened very carefully to what people thought were the issues that needed to be tackled and we were able to, as we went through the implementation plan process, start to test drive some of the thoughts that we had. Um, that proved to be very successful and um, I think we got a good understanding of where people thought the issues had to be tackled. Uh, much of that process has carried on into uh, where we are now. As far as uh, the 21 recommendations that were all accepted are concerned, um, we, we, I'm, I'm probably not the best place to talk about the, the details of the bill itself. Others are more qualified to do that, and I think you have heard from some of them. But um, certainly, from my perspective, the bill has been uh, chosen to be put together in a relatively light fashion. Uh, that does mean that uh, we won't have to. Uh, that, that, that the implement it will not get in the way of any of the recommendations being implemented. But they aren't all set out as part of the bill itself. Uh, the bill is an enabling bill to allow us to do everything we need to do, and it, and, and it will do so. Thank you. Um, do either of the other two want to comment on these issues? Very fully from my point of view. Yeah. Yes, there have been the broad thrust of the discussion in the group that was working is, is reflected. The detail is everything. And uh, I think you know, some of the aspects of the detail will no doubt be the focus of your discussions, um, but uh, working through those details will be critical. All right, thank you. And now Dean Lockhart. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Convener, and good morning to our guests. Uh, we've seen from other recent government uh, initiatives, for example, the Scottish Growth Scheme, that a supply of money and a supply of capital has been available to the economy, but there has been insufficient uptake in those uh, financing initiatives because there's been a lack of demand uh, in the economy itself. There hasn't been a sufficient number of growing businesses to, to access that supply of, of, of finance and capital. Do you still see that lack of demand being an issue? And if so, how will the bank address that? Uh, Paul Brewer. Uh, it's difficult to talk about supply and demand across the whole system of investment because it varies a lot at different levels. And uh, you need different interventions at the, the microfinance level where businesses are still developing their capacity to raise finance, um, their understanding of what financiers are seeking, can often require development before you can raise the finance. 
um, as compared with companies which are going into their second or third phases of financing, where um, you're actually dealing with uh, investors who are going to be looking very closely at your performance and your products and bringing in larger amounts of money and taking greater risks. So if, if, if you can generalise broadly about Scotland, the, the microfinance and business angels, uh, Scottish Investment Bank and so on, I think compare very well with any other jurisdiction that you look at these activities. I think Scotland particularly strong in uh, the angel investment network, but when companies are getting on to their second and third phases of growth, there are far fewer Indigenous <coughs> investors and they've got to look more widely for uh, finance, which is not a bad thing in itself, but it means that they are actually competing in a much more crowded market. So there are areas where it's, you need to stimulate demand or support companies to create demand that financiers will respond to, but there are other areas where, where there are gaps, particularly for companies growing beyond the Scottish Investment Bank's capability to invest and looking for larger sums. Alan McFarlane. I think your question uh, touches on one of the reasons why this is um, fundamentally a good idea to form this type of institution. Because making funds available through a particular period of time and expecting there be automatically to be demand for it, um, that is not how life goes on. But to have an entity which is here for the long term, which is demonstrably patient, which is evergreen, which is continuing, and one of the things that's very striking about the British Business Bank and its website is, is um, a recognition about making it clear to people what is available. And so having a programme at a particular time and hoping for uptake is great, but there can be no guarantee in that. But an enduring and continuing entity that makes it its business to let everybody know that this is here and it's available, um, I think is a big step forward. So uh, you're right, it'd be great if there'd be more uptake, um, but I wouldn't say that dams anything. Yeah, I think your question's a very good question because obviously a supply of capital doesn't solve anything unless there is sufficient demand. I, th I see the creation of the bank not only as something which will add a very important new piece to the ecosystem in Scotland, but also as an opportunity for Scotland to use it as a catalyst to start to uh, unclutter the landscape and to ensure that other parts of the apparatus work together properly. Specifically, Scottish Enterprise, HI, the developing south of Scotland Enterprise, other government departments um, and various other bodies. This has got to be the time over the next couple of years where we get all of these pieces of apparatus working together um, in an uncluttered way. We, we've got to f get out of finding kind of refuge. If we do find refuge in complexity, we've got to look for simplicity. We've got to, l there's got to be a level of collaboration that I don't think we have seen as effectively uh, as, as it should be. Um, we have a lot of strengths in Scotland. A very obvious one is the university sector, but far too many of our great research projects that then move into development get trapped at micro um, cap level. And that's because there's a, there isn't a sufficient understanding and level of support about how to use different kinds of finance, equity and debt. Um, so I think it's a good question. The bank in itself doesn't solve demand. Origination will come from some of the other uh, parties I've mentioned, but we need to use it as a catalyst to resolve the issues. And I think we've got a great opportunity to do so. It would be a missed chance if we didn't. Th thank you. That, that brings me on to the next question. You've touched on interaction with other agencies. Uh, the question of demand, I guess, uh, raises that question of if the bank is a supplier of capital, that your, your reach can only go so far. That underlying stimulus and, and changing culture, generating a more enterprising economy, is going to need more than a supply of capital. How, will, how do you see that being done in order for the bank's mission to be successful? Uh, and how will that interaction with the other agencies work, work in practice? Will demand and origination still sit with Scottish Enterprise and the enterprise agencies? Or uh, what part will the bank, or what part might the bank have in stimulating demand? We are actually working very closely at project level just now. I mean, we're effectively running, to an extent, a shadow bank, um, using the resources available from the Building Scotland Fund and, and other, other pools of res resource. 
the Scottish investment bank SIB that exists today as part of Scottish Enterprise will come across. But we are working very closely. Origination will take place, not in the bank itself, although in, I think we've got to distinguish between the SME sector and the long-term patient capital uh, projects that will be mission-related. The mission-related ones will be, the, the bank will effectively be working on more of the origination there, but as far as SMEs are concerned, uh, that will be the existing agencies and also government departments, but principally existing agencies. Um, British Business Bank, as you probably know, basically funds funders. That will be open to the bank, so some of that will take place, but we also want to make sure that there is direct investment coming from the bank, and that will be, um, that, that, the, the origination engine will be other parts of the apparatus. That's why we have to work closely. But we're working hand in glove with Scottish Enterprise, um, and indeed we will be with High over the, the rest of this year to make sure that, that because it's easy to say, as, as Alan said, the devil's in the detail. It's easy to say that's where origination lies. We've got to work hand in glove. If you say that quickly, it sounds straightforward. What you've got to do is work out precisely how you do that, and that's what we're doing. I have to say, Steve Dunlop, who is the relatively new chief executive of Scottish Enterprise, has been very, uh, very, you know, committed to making sure that this working relationship and collaboration does uh, get to the right place. Thank you. I've got a few other questions, but I'll, I'll uh, come back to them later. Alan McFarlane, I think, wants to come in. Just want to comment on demand. Um, I used to work for one of the sort of predecessors of what's proposed here, and I think one of the, one of the things that I hope is useful to the committee is. I think this rests on about 40 or 50 years of experience because we've had organisations, some of you will have known, I think, called ICFC, it's now called 3i, which was partly owned by the Bank of England, then under the SDA, the Scottish Development Fund. So before George Matthewson left the SDA, he had brought with him some people who were specialists in small, small business investing. And your point about demand, the, the demand in the early 1980s was a very rapidly changing economy, and a lot of it was management buyouts. It was taking, some of you might remember, the Karen Steelworks at Falkirk, and Scottish Development Agency Finance was instrumental, along with the private sector, in helping buy out at least three of those divisions. Not so much of that today. So the demand is changing, and it's changing to do with technology and marketing, and some of the other industries in, in which we're um, active. I think, if, if you forgive me, I think your point was how cyclical is the economy and how cyclical is demand? Well, I'm afraid I can't help you on that one. But if you have an institution that is permanent, the likelihood of matching the supply to the demand rises. Mm. So it seems to this interested layman that um, to have a body that is ultimately not part of SE and that is financial, and acts as a serious long-term investor, the net effect is good. Whether it will stimulate demand, I think it highly likely the answer is yes. The extent is the question. We can come back to this a little bit later. I don't want to hog the microphone. I think my, my question was more structural in terms of the missing middle. I mean, we, this uh, this uh, committee has heard evidence before. We've got many micro-businesses in Scotland, a couple of very large ones, but it's the missing middle that we need to scale up on. And I think the bank might be part of that answer, but the, there's a, a wider restructuring of the landscape that, that seems to me necessary to, to uh, grow that missing middle. But perhaps we can, we can come back to that later. Unless one of the panellists wanted to comment on that. Paul Brewer. Uh, oh, the, the only thing I'd add is that I think Benny's distinction between the investment into the SME sector and the mission-oriented element is very important because in those areas where the bank's going to focus, it will make a real difference to our economy, it's going to have to bring considerable expertise and actually work as part of the whole ecosystem, <coughs> whether it's low carbon um, or digital and data, um, where we've got fantastic academic expertise, and it's going to have to work with academia, with existing businesses, with other investors, and actually make Scotland a place where people actually see a really fertile investment environment and bring considerable expertise, which is a different environment to the the one that supports SMEs. So the bank's going to have to have expertise in both of these areas. Okay, thank you. All right. Uh, Gordon MacDonald. Thanks very much, convener. Uh, the bank is to be capitalised over the first 10 years by about £2 billion. Pounds. What impact could this have on the Scottish economy? Perhaps I could, I could start. Um, don't know the answer precisely. What I do know is if we deploy £2 billion 
uh, in both the area of the market, which has been alluded to a number of times already, which is the opportunity for SMEs to scale up. Mm -hmm. It really can it can it can actually feed ambition because that's what we need. We need we need to have SMEs that are prepared to go from a micro business to a more credible sort of uh, sm small business yeah. to a, a bigger business. Uh, we do also need to ensure that we are. I mean, the the, the hallmarks of successful economies in the 21st century will be those that um, are focused on carbon neutrality, that are focused on automation, artificial intelligence, machine learning, mm -hmm. and those that are responding to demographic changes. Scotland is actually quite well placed in some of that and not so well placed in others. Uh, we've got a good track record in renewable, but we haven't really industrialised the impact for ourselves um, in terms of what goes on in the universities around data, robotics, yeah. automation, a great basis, but as I mentioned earlier, the opportunity to make those businesses grow, I think, is a place where the bank can play a part. Um, as, as far as responding to the demographic challenge, we start in quite a difficult place because our demographic challenge is, is probably a, is, is harder than on average. Um, but we need to make sure that the bank can make contributions so that we are better placed. Two billion pounds is 1.3 percent of GDP. It's about in line with what many of the other national investment banks around Europe, especially if you look at some of the smaller advanced nations, which you know we have to consider ourselves to be one of them. Um, so 1.3% GDP is, is not unreasonable. We also, in the longer run, will look to ways in which we can leverage that. Uh, direct leverage would require a change of um, uh, um, uh, uh, the, uh, would require a dispensation from Treasury, but there are other ways in which you can you can use um, the capital to, to leverage through co-investment and guarantees and so on. So what the impact will be, I think, would be a very difficult thing to speculate about. But mm -hmm. putting two billion into the economy, if we can manage to use this as the catalyst to get the rest of the framework in place, mm -hmm. gives us a wonderful opportunity to make a big difference. Okay, so. <laughs> that two billion uh, will that act as leverage to get private investment in, into companies and, and organisations. Well, we could. You could. I mean, one of the things that would be commonplace would be co co investment. Mm -hmm. So we. I mean, that's what say Green Investment Bank was doing, mm -hmm. for example. I mean, Green Investment Bank. Th there are many examples of things which give us a some encouragement about the the, the type of things the bank will do. Um, but we've you know we've also talked. Uh, to some of the banks around the world. We visited KFW, uh, we've been to see the Irish banks. I'm, I'll be going out to see the, the Finnish uh, bank uh, quite soon that does very similar things. So we've just got to look and learn from other, other organisations. But co-investment is one of the ways in which we can also start to create markets. Mm -hmm. Because in the terms of the long-term mission-related projects, the, the, the private sector's risk appetite is such that it, it, it will not invest in some of these projects um, because of the timelines involved. We'd rather hope that with um, an anchor investment from the Scottish National Investment Bank, we may encourage some more investment. Okay. But, you know, that, that's, that's there to, to be played out. Yeah. Mm. Um, this is not entirely incremental money. So Scottish Enterprise's own report from last year, which I'm sure you, they, they send you, um, there were £538 million worth of deals done in Scotland, and it's been on an upward trend since 2012. Mm -hmm. So £2 billion is two, £200 million per annum over 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, Benny is, I don't wish to disagree with my chair, but Benny is absolutely right. But you could argue that the, um, the denominator is not £170 billion of Scotland's GNP, but 10 times that number. So I think going back to uh, uh, Mr Lockhart's question, um, it is potentially very significant if targeted, but it, a blunderbuss it cannot be. So I think one of the key missions for its board of directors um, uh, when constituted will be to work that out. Now, just to take the point about the middle, let's assume there are, 100 there are um, a group of companies in Scotland for which £10 million would be the appropriate financing. Now, this bank will not leverage on its current so it's just clear what we're talking about in terms of leverage here. Mm -hmm. Leverage traditionally means you take your own balance sheet and you borrow money against it. Yeah. That is not intended. It's explicitly forsworn in, in the draft bill. So leverage would need to be influencing others to behave mm -hmm. differently than otherwise they would. And there's clear evidence from Scottish Enterprise that um, Scottish Investment Bank has been quite good at that already yeah. uh, with the co-investment fund. Yeah. So that's a, a solid foundation of optimism. But were it to be 10 million, 
that's 200 companies. 200 companies ignoring the mission stuff, if that's all it did. So 200, 200 companies in a cash out of 10 million each. Were they the missing middle and were they constituted differently? Yes, that would be a great success. So that's what I mean about the detail and numbers. It's, it's, the, it's the ambition measured by the actual funds available. I should add, it's very clear from the draft bill that the money is committed to 2021. So, and, and, and bearing in mind that things do change in politics, I think if there is a, cr the more there's a cross-party parliamentary commitment to the two billion, because what's committed is 320, plus the 300 coming from SIB's, Scottish Investment Bank's existing portfolio, mm -hmm. um, you run all those numbers together, and there's bits of this I think are a stretch, but they're not damning. They, there's a real basis for incremental improvement in the middle, but those are the kind of numbers I'd be delighted you took away. Okay. Thanks very much for that. Um, I'm sure some of my colleagues will talk about the, the mission statement and the focus of the bank. A couple of questions I've got left to ask. The financial memorandum highlights that in year one operating costs will be 15.6 million, rising to just over 25 million by 2025-26. Are the proposed levels of operating costs in its first few years realistic? Yes. Um, I mean, we, we basically modelled it on the basis of what we think the activity will be, the number of people involved. So it's, it's our best guess. We've taken as many readings against you know similar organisations, and um, so we think it's realistic. But, well, why does RSE say, and it's evidence that they think um, that there could be problems with that level of um, operating costs? I think you should ask them, but we've... Well, I'm tempted. Yeah, no, no, that's fine. I mean, uh, look, all I can say is we've, we've sought to try and be as realistic as possible about the, the, the cost structure. Um, we, we think it, at, at kind of at once once the bank is established, it would have probably between 85 and a bit more than 100 uh, people in the business mm -hmm. um, and the institution. Um, so that's a real... It's, what, it's, been, it's been test driven against uh, by, by various people to try and make sure that we're in the right ballpark. And, um, you know, the, the, there is a, a related issue around pay, which um, is you know we've talked about it, but it, but that will still still have to be ultimately handled before before we're done. Okay, thanks very much. Um, Angela Constance, did you want to? Come on? Thank you, convener, and good morning to the panel. Uh, following on from my colleague, uh, Mr. Macdonald, um, I just always like to cut to the chase. So I just wondered if there had been any projections or modelling done about what the uh, government can expect for £2 billion worth of investment, any projections over the numbers of jobs created or supported, the number of businesses started or supported to grow uh, or you know the ratio of capital that can be then leveraged in um, I, th I think it's it's an, another version of the question that was asked earlier is what do you get for your two billion what will the impact be in the economy so I'm not sure I can do much better than the answer we gave you when we, we are working at the moment on what the key performance indicators for the bank should be one has to remember we have to get back to the national performance framework that's that's what we're trying to achieve in Scotland um, and the bank should play its part in achieving that um, once we've, we've, we've still got quite a lot of work to do um, Royal Ascent will probably take place around this time next year um, by that point we will have a chair we'll have a board we'll have an executive team um, so there's quite a lot more work to, 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 to do and um, we'll have to start to develop what the, the kind of KPIs will be um, but I think at this juncture trying to project what the numbers of jobs created or businesses created. We do know that we need to create more jobs, we need to create more businesses in Scotland, we need to help the um, micro-caps become mid-caps and mid-caps become bigger businesses. This is, a, this, this is a great chance to make a big impact on that, but we, so don't, we don't have... We yeah, don't have just to be clear, I'm, I'm not asking you <clears throat> to uh, look at your crystal ball, mm -hmm. um, but um, bearing in mind that there are some... Uh, reasonably solid work done that, you know, for example, we demonstrate that for every £100 million of capital investment that can support 1,400 jobs. But there mm. must be, you know, some sort of modelling or mm. projections or some sort of aspiration about what sort of 
um, ballpark we're in in terms of job creation and uh, supporting businesses. Yeah, and that, that, that we haven't got those projections at the moment. Right. Okay, yeah. we don't know. Yes, I mean, I think um, a starting point that's really important is not to put a, a huge short-term burden of expectation on the deployment of these resources because the whole purpose of the bank mm. is to take a long-term view. So I think what's going to be really important is when it's subject to regular scrutiny from uh, some ministers and, and their teams and periodic independent, periodic independent scrutiny that's proposed, that there is real thought about the balanced set of measures that you're looking at. Uh, I mean, to take an example on jobs, it would probably be seen as a success if the, uh, the bank uh, in its early days funded another unicorn, a sky scanner, say. Yet that is relatively few jobs. It's a big economic success. Um, it's a big success in helping the sector in which it operates have high prominence and pull people into new jobs, but it doesn't create a lot of jobs in itself. If it supports um, a more effective approach to care of the elderly through its investment, that's something which is probably likely to in involve a very high number of jobs per pound invested because it's a very people intensive business. So the measures against which it's going to have to be accountable um, are going to have to cover quite a wide spread. And I think if you were to um, start out with an expectation of targets for uh, jobs created, GDP, incremental GDP generated in the early days, taxes put into the economy by the, these companies operating and so on, you can't, it'll be very difficult to um, target in a way that's constructive to the bank's mission for the first few years until you see how it's delivering. But on the other hand, you, know, you will have to have robust scrutiny to make sure that it is delivering. Well, if you start with SE and Scottish Investment Bank, so their annual report, which I presume went through an auditor before it was published, says that in 2017-18, uh, <clears throat> it invested 43.5 million. Now, this one would be a run rate of 200. So, uh, just say, call it 50 million, so four times more. 147 Scottish companies, and I think that's where the demand question will come in. Are they there? Mm. So, patience will be a virtue. And that, based on the whole book, not that one year, but the whole book, SE claims that we're on a £300 million portfolio, that's the only number I can extract from their accounts that equates to the asset value of what they've got, that that led to turnover of £400 million. So that would be a one-point times factor. So if £2 billion went in and did 1.25, the Scottish GDP wouldn't be 175, it would be near 100, it may be near 180. And that a significant proportion of that turnover was export, some of that will be to export to the rest of the UK, and that's 3,400 jobs. So their numbers would suggest that 88,000 pounds of investment generates a job. Now, whether that's their investment or leveraged via others, I don't know, but the baseline must be the existing effort. Okay. And the working assumption is more is better, but it must be targeted apropos the demand point. Okay, uh, thank you for that. Um, Thanks, SE, for that. I'm all, all, for, um, <laughs> all for us having the, the courage to take a longer term view as long as we're setting our ambitions uh, high enough. Um, just uh, one final question, convener. Um, uh, I'm sure the panel are well aware that there is a, a good solid business case for getting more women uh, into business. Um, there's been a, a ream of work evidence that this committee uh, has had made available to it in terms of that uh, if we address the uh, uh, gender balance and the number of uh, women-led companies, that would have a real positive impact, uh, £13 billion on to our GVA, for, for example. So I just wondered in terms of the initial thinking of the strategic uh, purpose of the bank, what consideration has been given uh, to have some targeted uh, endeavours that we see the number of women participating in business in Scotland grow? I think that's just a given these days. It's the best people in the best jobs and the, the effort. I mean, the, the notion now 
that um, any candidate would be debarred for a job, let alone on entrepreneurial backing on race, creed, colour, gender. I, 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 I don't want to be dismissive. I completely agree with you. But I'm trying to speak from the side of I, th I think much has been achieved and only, only more can be. Um, I'm optimistic that some of the demand will come from all walks of Scotland's population. Um, if you're suggesting that there needs to be a key element in the mandate, that that should be taken as a given, that would be a good thing. Um, I'm not implying it's redundant, but in my day-to-day -day life, I, I don't see those barriers in any way operating anymore. So, given that organisations like, uh, you know, Women in Business Scotland, Women's Enterprise Scotland, uh, would be able to ably demonstrate that uh, quite often women uh, face a lot of additional barriers to access and finance uh, for their companies, as well as a lot of uh, assumptions about, you know, perhaps some of the types of businesses uh, that, that women lead as well. Um, do you think uh, there should be consideration given to um, you know, quite a strategic focus uh, about women and business, bearing in mind that it isn't just about rebadging what hasn't already worked to increase the number of women in business? If that evidence exists, then yes. Uh, since it exists, then yes. Not if. Since it exists. And we all work in different industries. Some industries are way, way more integrated than others. And there, are may, there may well be areas that we wish were up with best practice. And if uh, the evidence is clear, since the evidence is clear, putting that in the bank's mandate that it should be open to all, regardless of all the, all the things that we hold dear as openness in society, then yeah, that, that would be great. And it'd be even greater if the outturn um, was that way. Certainly, if you look at the British Business Bank's reporting, they're very hot on this. They're very hot on it in terms of who they invest with and their staff makeup and, and so on. All I'm trying to convey is that I think in many, many parts of the economy now, why would anyone deny themselves access to the very best talent? Okay, okay. thanks. Can can just, um, just pick up on that. I mean, to, to, to reinforce everything that Alan said, I mean, there will be a broader question of, of what is going to be the ethical code that the bank will pursue on a much broader set of questions. Um, but the opportunity, as I said a number of times already, to use this as the catalyst to make a lot more change than simply create a, a greater supply of capital, which in itself is a good thing, but it's a great opportunity for us to change things. And certainly as far as the bank itself is concerned, we will be setting out to make sure that it embraces diversity in its broadest sense. Um, just remember, quite apart from all the moral kind of reasons for having, um, uh, you know, pursuing diversity, cognitive diversity makes you a better yes. um, institution. Um, it's, it's, the, it's the right way forward. It's got to be. We've got to lay down some markers about the way we want to um, go forward in Scotland. Thank you, Andy Whiteman. Uh, thanks, Kevin. I want to ask some questions about governance, but first of all, I just want to follow up. Um, Gordon MacDonald's line of questioning on <coughs> investment. It's my understanding that the capitalisation of the bank up to 2021 is to be provided through financial transactions. Um, and the rules about how they are used is are set down by HM Treasury and they can only be used for the provisions of loans or equity to the private sector. Um, yet the policy memorandum does say in paragraph 17, page 3, that the bank will lend solely to the private sector. It will not lend to public institutions, including local authorities, government agencies, or arms-length bodies. There's nothing to stop the bank in law in this bill doing that. Uh, and there's no rules around finance beyond financial transactions. Um, beyond 2021, it'll be resources voted by parliament. I'm just wondering where you think this statement comes and whether you actually agree with it, that the bank should only lend to private sector. To be, to, be, to be honest, it's the, what, what, we, what we when we set about asking ourselves what it is that the bank should do, we've got to make sure that the bank makes a difference. So we're trying to address the issues in Scotland that don't get tackled either well enough or at all at the moment. And the two very specific areas are in, in, ensuring that where we can stimulate ambition, that businesses can grow from being small to being bigger and be on a path to becoming much bigger companies. And the other is the mission related, which gives us an opportunity to invest in the areas which will give us the, if you like, the, put us in a place where we have the hallmarks of a, an economy that can su succeed in the 21st century. That was 
our, that was what we discovered during our um, implementation plan phase, and therefore the bank investing in, organ in private companies that will participate in those ways is the focus of the bank. No, no I understand that that is the, the focus. There's nothing in legislation to, to stop the bank doing that, and there's yeah. nothing proposed in yeah. the memorandum, the draft memorandum and articles to do that, just as a factual point. Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah. Yes. I mean, so, the, the, for example, if a mission was set by ministers in two or three years' time on infrastructure and housing, for example, yeah. it's self-evident that the public sector, cooperatives, mutuals are well-placed to deliver that, and the bank would be in a position, if it so chose, to lend yes. for that. Absolutely. We're clear on that. So yes. there, there is no strict legislative prohibition, yeah. and it's not really ruled out. It's just... Absolutely not. Okay, that's that's helpful. Thanks. Um, on the question of, of governance, um, obviously a lot of the governance of the bank um, is uh, laid down, set out under under company uh, law, but of course it is overlain with statutory provisions in this bill and a, a certain role for Parliament as well. So first of all, I just wanted to ask a question about ownership. The bill makes clear um, that ministers are the only member um, of the bank. Um, KFW in Germany, for example, 20% of the membership is, is the lender. Is there not a role for other bits of government, particularly local government, in a national investment bank? Did you think about that or not? Yeah, I mean, we, we, we gave consideration to different models. We, we believed that the, the best way in which to serve the, the Scottish economy in the long run was to have clear, unequivocal ownership by Scottish government. But we did look at different alternatives, but we concluded that that was the best. OK, have you got... Um, c can you supply us with any more information on that evaluation that you made? or? Uh, I mean, we can probably get back to you on that, I think. We'll, we can look at yeah. some of the papers that we, that we, we looked at. But we, we, we had extensive conversations about different models of ownership and judged that 100% owned by Scottish Government was the right answer. OK, thanks. Oh, I'm sorry. sorry man. <clears throat> the obvious difference is the lender are all probably 5 million and up in population. So in terms of an economic unit in which that could operate, you could argue that the structure that the UK's got now is that the British Business Bank can operate here and has already. On its website, there are a number of examples of Scots-based companies that are being supported by the British Business Bank. So the diversity question I think you were implying, not only about ownership but of operation generally, my view is actually that's quite well served. <clears throat> and also, I remember a lot of the angel investment in Scotland essentially comes through the public purse, um, through tax relief. So from the standpoint of a diverse public sector involvement in activity across the SME sector in Scotland, I'm content that there's a huge amount of diversity. And I think at this stage, um, conceiving, I mean, the, the obvious argument might be that HIE or SE or some others might have a stake. I, I think for where we are just now, and Benny's comments about 20 minutes ago about the, about the benefit of focus, I think they outweigh multiple ownership. doesn't say never, but for today, I think it, it's strongly argued in favour of a single point of ownership and contact. Yes, just to be clear, I wasn't suggesting multiple ownership or Scottish entities Sorry, or any of these bodies because they are owned by Scottish or governed by Scottish ministers. I was purely looking at the local uh, government point of view. Um, another bit of the, go the governance is the so-called advisory group, which is talked about and discussed. Um, it's not put on a statutory footing, so this is um, something that uh, the legislation doesn't have any... Uh, doesn't say anything uh, about, but the Royal Society of Edinburgh, for example, advise against giving this body a significant um, role, um, and others have questioned what uh, role it might play and whether there would be potentially any clash with the with the board of the bank. Can you elaborate a little bit more on the thinking behind this advisory board, and in particular, whether if it is to be play a significant role, that role should be set out in the bill? Well, perhaps I'll, I'll start and then uh, my colleagues can join in. Um, first of all, we have to be very clear that the, if I just take a step back, um, there will be a strategic framework which I see as an envelope within which the bank will operate. What we're seeking to create is an envelope that allows the bank to be operationally independent uh, with a board and an executive team 
to pursue the aims of the bank within a risk appetite that's set out in that, that envelope uh, with obviously some reserve matters that would go back to, to ministers. The advisory group was really, um, the genesis of that was as we did go around and talk to people, there was a belief that it was important to have a voice that could advise ministers on the bank's operation and the bank's uh, and and how the bank's pursuing its strategy. But we have to be very clear: if we want an institution that's going to be um, a, a bank, uh, we need to have people who are bankers running it. There is no alternative to that, and we have to make sure that they can operate uh, independently within the envelope. So an advisory board will have a voice to inform ministers as the owners of the bank, um, but th they will they, there will not be. Um, they will not inhibit the bank's operation on a day-to-day -day basis. So, uh, there are examples of um, you know, advisory boards being given um, quite significant power and say in uh, organisations like which have a public sector mission like Network Rail and Welsh Water. But what you find is that if you've got a very diverse group of voices contributing to something that has to make decisions, it is very difficult for it to be an effective decision maker. And, and these bodies sometimes then find themselves just being rather led by a chairman's views because they can't get everyone else to agree. So whilst I think Benny's emphasised the importance of ministers getting a diverse group of voices, giving them that advice on the bank, if you start to wire that directly into decision making or um, supervision of decisions, it is actually quite difficult to, to make it work at a practical level. And coming back to your, your point on making investment into um, public bodies, just briefly, um, I think wiser minds than mine on, on public sector finance would have to verify this, but I suspect if you started investing directly into public sector bodies, the, uh, the budget that you're putting into that would score in a different way and potentially come out of capital resources, you know, depleting the, the, the finance available for, for other uses of those resources, whereas financial transactions is, is clearly quite delineated for going into the private sector and is, is additional to, to government's other resources. So it's possible you would um, end up effectively in the same place as if... Um, the money had been put in directly by government rather than by the bank. Uh, I could follow that up later. I mean, I, yeah. I'm not sure Scottish ministers have the power to provide financial transactions that are not backed by the Treasury, uh, but we can... No, no. no but so it would be resource. Yeah, but, but Scottish... It, 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 would, yeah, it would be resource money if it was put in directly, I think. I think the advisory board, I, I, Benny's continued to be involved in the last year since the paper. I, I haven't. This is, so I've, I've gone back and refreshed everything. Um, there's clearly a role for an advisory board, but I would argue much later. Um, it, it, needn't, it needn't be right up front. If you think about what's here, and this is the same model as Development Bank of Wales and the British Business Bank, this bank's board of directors will have all the responsibilities under Companies Act that any of you have as directors of any company that you have. So the annual audit will have to address solvency, going concern, all of that. And it's going to make losses for the first three or four years. So it's going to be imperative that they have an extremely close and confident relationship between the board of directors and their shareholders, which will be the Scottish ministers. Um, I think to have, and let's put it in its worst terms possible, um, an audience of fans baying for the manager to be sacked three games in, that's the worst possible outcome. An advisory board that once it's up and running, once it's established itself, once it's answered the very big questions that Benny addressed about some of the mission-led work, it seems to me that that would be a moment. So I wouldn't be, um, despite having been involved in the report, looking at the detail, I would want to put that down the track rather than up the front. And I just want to underline the responsibilities of directors may have been abrogated in far too many British and a Scottish companies in, in recent years, but they are serious and onerous obligations. And so vesting it in this structure, I think, brings many things, one of them, infinitely greater clarity about investment making and performance. And I want, I'm going to disagree slightly with the chairman again. I get the point about bankers, but this isn't a bank in the sense it's borrowing money. So I would argue that it's people with an investment focus, and he would say that given his background. But I, I think that 
combination of credit evaluation for loans and investment capability, which is exactly what Scottish Development Finance had under the SDA. So that's why you're, you're building on past experience here. Um, I think that structure with the obligations under Companies Act are very powerful bulwarks um, to the, the Scottish Government in making these investments. It's a different regime of governance um, than currently exists through SE and the SIB. Okay, if I could just maybe just finally just clarify this question about the advisory group, uh, uh, Mr. Higgins. So, the, so you understand that the advisory group advises ministers? Well, advises the bank. A, it, it, it has a voice. I think we've got to be very careful about the word advisory. Oh, okay, it, we'll set aside the advisory. It is a voice. It, it, but it, it advises ministers, not the bank. Not the bank. That's the way I see it, yeah. Uh, right. That now, is. Can, can, I just, can I also just say something else? Um, inevitably, the strength and effectiveness of this institution will be dependent on the quality of people that we get to chair um, be on the board and be on in the, 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 especially the senior executive positions. If we were to create a, an environment where there was another board that was meddling in decision making or, strate or strategic development, you wouldn't get the right kind of people. But n no one's suggesting that because no, no, I'm, I'm just yeah. making the point. That, okay. uh, uh, absolutely. Yeah. So um, I, I see the advisory board, and I, I take Alan's point. It may well be that you know it doesn't need to be there in, on day one. But it was responding to a desire from a broad church of people who said we'd like to have a voice that ministers would hear as they go through the strategic cycle, if you like. Um, and, and, and I also agree with Alan, it, it's not kind of traditional banking here, it is, but we do need people with investment and banking experience. And it, we need to get, we need to get the, the very best who are committed to making a success of this. Okay, thanks. All right. Uh, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this here, but you make the point, Alan McFarlane, about the director's duties and so forth. I'm not entirely persuaded by that sort of argument. Um, I don't know whether it's possible for you to provide something in writing following the committee meeting just to give us an idea of how you envisage that all working in terms uh, of the bank. Mr Chairman, if you don't mind, I won't. I'll just direct you to the Companies Act page of the UK government website and the duties of directors. They're well, I'm, I'm fully clear. aware of the duties of directors, but the question is how effective are these in terms of what is being set up here? Well, that goes back to the point about the calibre of the folks you want um, to have who are going to implement this. And in a sense, the greatest power is resignation. Um, so it's the maximum independently minded people who agree with the principles that are undertaken here um, and who agree and take the responsibility to carry this forward and in a sense receive the mandate from Scottish ministers and then say, well, we'll get on with this, but we're accountable for coming back. The, all you're hearing is that disclosure by public companies now is getting ever bigger. It's disclosure on gender equality. It's disclosure on economic and environmental impact. It's disclosure on pay disparity. It's disclosure on all of these things, and I'm presuming that, and it may be the wrong presumption, that the, that the new entity will be expected to do a have provide a degree of reporting on the companies in which it invests. And so the best standards of disclosure now are extremely high. And I think anyone taking on the responsibility and signing that Companies Act document to say, I will sign the annual report and accounts of this organisation, I repeat, is undertaking a degree of transparency that is not presently available, I understand, through the accounting models applied to Scottish Enterprise and other similar public bodies. All right, well, we'll move on from that. Um, Jamie Halker Johnson. Thank you very much, Convener. My question's uh, around the Scottish Government's consultation process on this. Um, I was wondering if the panel uh, are confident or satisfied that the um, that the Scottish Government's consultation included, uh, I suppose, enough businesses of all sizes, uh, communities, individuals, um, trade, trade unions and the like in the development of the bill, whether that was, whether that was enough, and also whether the con key concerns that came up during that consulta uh, consultation process have been addressed. Open consultation is open to anybody to, to make a contribution. We had a very large number in widespread contributions. I would say that the um, I'm, I'm certainly satisfied that anyone who wanted to put forward a, an opinion or a view or raise a concern had the opportunity to do so. We've also been informally, as I said, speaking to as many people as possible. Um, 
I, I should say that I'm delighted that there is very broad support for the bank mm. uh, from across the, the political spectrum and across the kind of ecosystem within um, the Scottish economy. Uh, there were some issues raised. Um, a question over is it will it be big enough? Uh, questions over pay. Um, how will we operate pay policy? Will it be within the public pay policy or not? Or how many will be and how many not? Uh, those questions about will there be an ethical code? How would the approach to missions be? Um, how many would there be and how would we start to develop more missions? But all legitimate questions, but actually from a position of almost you know universally strong support for the bank. And, and those, those areas of concern, how are they engaged within this development process? Well, we're continuing to work on them as we speak um, on, on each of them. An ethical code will be put together. Uh, we're, we've started to have conversations within the project around uh, creating a, a, a pay policy. Mm -hmm. um, we've been, uh, the question of scale, um, as we've already covered it, um, obviously if you had uh, more money to uh, invest in the economy, you could you could go further, but two billion is, I think, a combination, a, a, a decent, um, if you like, balance between aspiration and, and impact. Um, so I think we're, we're working our way through all of the issues. Okay. Some, some of those areas, particularly around ethical investment, I think will be followed up by colleagues later. So I'll just move on to a, another area. One of the, um, uh, you mentioned earlier, or somebody mentioned earlier, that there had been engagement with High, and I'm just wondering how that, um, I suppose the kind of regional aspect uh, has been incorporated into the development process, into the consultation and the development process. Obviously, in, in uh, some of uh, some of the regions of Scotland, would maybe feel that there is a focus, perhaps, on the central belt. I was wondering if, if that's been taken into account and how we can ensure that the bank doesn't focus on on perhaps the more traditional areas of uh, investment and that Scotland's regions are, are included too. Yeah, I, I think it's quite important at this juncture to understand that the project is about fundamentally building the capability to be able to do the right thing for the Scottish economy. Mm -hmm. um, I'm visiting the High Board in about a month's time to talk them through what we're doing, talk them through what the opportunities for them will be. Um, we see the, 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 you know, the opportunity for the bank to participate in investing investments across Scotland is really important. So that the agenda outside the central belt will, will be important. But we're not at a phase at the moment where we're executing that change but it is very much um, clear that it's an important part of what we have to do. Okay. Um, just, just a very um, quick kind of last point, um, and it was touched on, I think, by Angela Constance when she was talking about, um, uh, uh, in obviously, the, the role of women of making sure that um, opportunities for women within the bank and the, and the structure are there. I was just running about um, other areas of diversity, um, and particularly areas around young people, small business owners, ethnic minorities in the third sector, how you can ensure that they are not only involved, they've not only been involved in, uh, in the consultation process, but also represented in the bank's activities going forward? It's really, a, I think we would be repeating some of the things Alan and, and Paul said and I said earlier. Um, as we move forward, it's important that this is the chance to tackle um, making sure that all of these areas get a, appropriate investment. Um, I mean, the, the bank, we can't imagine the bank is going to be created to solve every problem, let's be clear. The bank is adding an important, a really critically important additional piece of apparatus but as I, I keep coming back to, this is also the opportunity for us to start to ask how does High, Scottish Enterprise, South of Scotland, other government departments start to pull together in a different way to make sure that we tackle all of these issues that are being mentioned. Okay. Right, thanks very much. Uh, as you'll gather, the, uh, the convener has had to leave temporarily to attend another committee, uh, so I am temporarily uh, convening. Uh, so I think, uh, I think, Angela Constance, you've already asked your yeah. questions. That's right, so on to Jackie Bailey. Very much, convener. Um, I want to turn to the mission approach because evidence given to the committee suggests that um, it's going to be complex to introduce, it's going to be difficult to operate and evaluate. What's your view on that? Start with Benny Higgins. Um, I, well, I don't agree with whoever said that, um, first of all. <laughs> it clearly um, wasn't you. <laughs> it wasn't me, you know. Um, I think we've got to be clear. That, I mean, there, there is an argument for us not having very many missions at the start. This is a bank that we're setting up. I mean, this is probably a, a moment to also say the following. To use maybe, it might not be the best analogy, but we're, what, we want to give birth to a bank this time next year. Um, the bank will develop 
as it, uh, over the next, you know, de over the decades ahead of us. Um, there are very important tectonic shifts taking place in the world economy, and they have to be reflected in how we manage the Scottish economy. Carbon neutrality, automation, demographic change are the obvious candidates. Therefore, what we need to do is create a process for the bank that allows government to understand where the mission f focus should be. And that mission focus will change over time. Um, as I say, there is an argument for not having too many. Carbon neutrality seems to be a very obvious one. Um, and that, therefore, I think as we follow through the process of deciding which ones they'll be, that will be one. And we've got to make sure that the investments we make, we find refuge in simplicity, not in complexity. Uh, we find refuge in doing the right thing. Um, I think that the others I've mentioned will, will be strong candidates too, along with, you know, social housing is a very important part part of what we need to do in the Scottish economy. So I think, you know, co complexity in all the businesses I've been part of, what you've got to do is you've got to try and find simplicity as far as you can. Complexity is an easy place to go. It can often be a refuge um, because actually it's a place to hide. We can't hide in complexity. We've got to make big decisions, get them right and move on with a clear, clear strategic focus. I think it's in our own hands to keep it simple. Okay. Come in. Yes, I, I think yeah, you, you always start with complexity when you're trying to prioritise limited resources in, in areas where there, there's a huge scope to deploy them. But um, I, I think the, the mission, that you're determining the missions for the bank is, is incredibly important from two dimensions. One is its relevance to achieving the, the national performance outcomes that you're aiming for. And the second is its effect in doing that. And uh, I'd agree with Benny that it's, you know, it, it, may, it may be difficult to decide what to prioritise, but if you start with too many missions at the outset, you will probably underachieve in all of them. And um, if you look back at the Green Investment Bank, for example, they caused great frustration in their early days about the things that they were not investing in. Um, they didn't invest in green technologies. They were very focused in uh, uh, investing in pro projects that took technology in, technologies into reality, for example. And that was probably the right decision in terms of the effects that they were um, that they had. They, they made a very significant difference at scale to the flow of finance into <coughs> offshore wind, uh, and many of the technologies they were being strongly encouraged to support were part of a, a great span of technologies, many of which succeeded, many of which didn't. But if they put resources into that, it would have drawn a huge amount of their capability. So the bank will have limited resources and it's, it's only going to be effective if it prioritises where it places them. Um, there's lots of competing options. I think one of the difficulties is that the term mission uh, is undefined. I don't mean in this document, I mean in wider life. We haven't, we haven't got a common grasp of what we mean by that. And certainly as Benny uh, indicated, um, there are a few commonly agreed missions without agreeing what mission is. So um, I think the, the, the best way, if it's slightly naughty way to do it, is to think of what wouldn't you want to do. So if there was still a coal mine in Scotland and it was about to uh, expand, would SNIB invest in it? If INEOS got the chance to frack, um, would you fund a community organisation that wanted it to happen? All of these things, well, some of them answer themselves mm. for just very obvious reasons. But then there's the more ticklish ones about oil supply or um, if somebody in Scotland made the best vaping cigarette, would you, would you invest in that? So these are generally problematic, but usually individually much easier, is, is my experience of ethically based investing and working with clients from all religious and philosophical backgrounds as to, as to how you implement this. I think the mission of the British Business Bank is very, very good. And if we could take, when we're framing these missions in Scotland, to take some of the ambitions about um, having a less carbon intensive economy and indicating how those two might interact. But this is where it has to be left to the board and management. 
and this is where it will be their job to interact between the friction of optimism and the reality of what's available to do and turn that into wealth and job generating businesses. It's the most patronising answer I can give you, but it's absolutely true in day-to-day -day activity. So, so you wouldn't put any question of the mission on the face of the bill because you would want to retain flexibility to do it over time, yet you yourself said this whole thing needs to be owned by Parliament as well? I think it's, it's a classic example of where the dialogue will occur through the annual report and accounts okay. of this organisation. It's dialogue between its shareholder and between uh, the company that um, is created by those shares. And as Benny said, if you start at the beginning with a few missions and, and two, one or two, which all the consensus of all the mm -hmm. consultation indicates that people are broadly behind, start with one or two, indicate how that friction happens between the government will and the practice of the bank in its day-to-day -day investments and indicate where tension occurs. I'm a great believer that friction yeah, it creates heat, but it also creates light. And I, th I think that is the way to go forward. But if you start with, we want, you know, if I ruled the world, and, and that, that would be great if all that happened. Well, we both know that it's not like that, but it's, there would be a, it would be appalling not to have high ambition at the outset. The question is how much of it and in what form and how does it hit the road between the board of directors, the executive and the shareholder? Okay. Let, let me continue with the theme of ambition, certainly in, in my head, about how the government would ensure that, that you know, what happens is legitimate, what happens delivers um, societal value, because that's one of the, the objectives. I've always believed that assessing social costs and benefits is very much at the heart of economic appraisal. Um, if you consider how it's done currently, um, for a particular project, say, you would assess net present value against Her Majesty's Treasury's Green Book. Um, what approach will you take in terms of assessing societal value? I still to agree precisely how we do that. We recognise that it is a very important part of what the bank is being created to achieve. Um, so that's work but, in progress. But this is key. This, this is, is key to realising yeah. whether this is this additionality actually works for the economy of Scotland. We've yeah. not yet done anything with it. Well, we've got the National Performance Framework, which yes. I think is a very, very important starting point. Um, so we've got to try and address how do we measure the bank's progress against that National okay. Performance Framework. So, so Her Majesty's Treasury's Green Book approach, is that featured in any of the discussions or debate? It's, it's been part of the conversations, but the National Performance Framework is the, is the outputs that we're right. trying to achieve. Okay. We have I'm, a National I'm, Performance I'm, Framework for a reason. I think no, it's actually a very, I think it's a very progressive thing. I okay. say that very we, apolitically. We, we I think also it's very have progressive. the Green Book for a very good reason, and it's yeah. been there and it's for not a been while ignored, yeah. and been updated. Yeah. Um, you say it's not being ignored. Mm. I would appreciate evidence as to how that's been considered. I don't know yeah. if either Alan McFarlane or Paul Brewer have anything to add? Nothing to add. Uh, Benny's been carrying the ball. And I can only say, it, it, the topic came up in terms of wider impact and wider discussion. Um, I, if I, forgive me, I would put it back to you as well. Are you content with the SIB's current reporting? Would you like more? Mm, indeed. Well, so they, it, 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 it's start with what you have and make it better. It, well, if we, that's the we, baseline. We have... A couple of people wanting to come okay. in with supplementaries. Do you want to... Thank no, I'll let people come in on supplementaries. I okay, will pursue this. If we've got time, I'll let you come back. Uh, Andy Whiteman, I think, first, and then Dean Yes, Walker. just briefly, I mean, we're scrutinising the bill. So uh, I'm, I'm curious that Chapter 2 of the bill, um, or Section 2 of the bill, um, uh, specifies that the bank's objects are set out in legislation shall be subject to resolution of Parliament. So Parliament has to sign off the objects, the, the bits of the, ob the, the objects of the company. But on the mission, the strategic missions in Section 11, um, there's no such role for Parliament to um, approve them. Uh, they'll just be laid before Parliament. Is the bill itself? The bill itself, yes. I'm just wondering whether, given the potential significance of the mission, a uh, strategic mission, that the Minister should also seek a resolution of Parliament to approve these, or was there good reason for not doing so? I think we've got to be careful not to assume that the three of us sitting here, even myself, who's been a strategic advisor to the project, are the experts on the positioning of the bill. Um, so I think there are others who are probably better qualified to talk about the w what, how the bill's been put together precisely the way it has. But it has been put together to try and make sure that, that it gives the opportunity for the smoothest and, and strongest governance of the running of the bank. So it's that, that, 
that is, as you say, it would be up to ministers to choose the missions, and that's the that's the way the bill's been proposed. So you don't, you don't have a view on whether I think it's the right. I, I agree with it. Okay. I, you know, I, I think having to go through parliamentary process to address the missions, I think we can we could over intellectualise this. There are very big obvious missions that we need to pursue in this country. Um, Alan has quite rightly said that the expression may not be very well defined or uniquely defined, um, but uh, you know what we do know is that we need to aim for carbon neutrality. We need to respond to the other things that we've talked about earlier. But you These say you missions. say we we need to. Yeah. Um, there's different views on what we need to do. Yeah. I mean, the, a resolution of Parliament is not a complex parliamentary procedure. Yeah. It's merely a resolution mm. that's debated and voted on. Mm. It's, not, it's not like this today. It's not yeah. legislative or anything like that. So the, the, the objects in Section 2 have to be subject to a resolution. Now, one wouldn't anticipate the objects, however they end up, mm. changing very often at all, if, yeah. if, if ever. So that, that's fair enough. Yeah. The mission will be a little bit more of a flexible thing. It yeah. will be reviewed yeah. and all the rest of it. So, I, I, so you, you're, you're clear that that shouldn't be subject to the same process. Do no, I, I'm so, sorry, I, I have no decision-making power. No, 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 this. I'm asking I, for your view. And, and, and I'm, I'm expressing my opinion. That That's I fine. Think this That's makes, I think this makes perfect sense. Yeah. Okay, one comment. In the financial memorandum, and I apologise, I didn't bring the whole thing, but in the financial memorandum, paragraph 11, which is what I thought you were talking about, I know that you're not, but it says, it talks about the mission approach and... In a sense, it highlights the, the vastness of this to support transformational change across a number of grand socio-economic challenges, which mm -hmm. we, we can agree exist. Mm -hmm. And I take your point, we might disagree about how to implement them. But then it says this, it is envisaged that the bank will respond to these missions through its investment strategy. Mm -hmm. So that's my point about the friction. Yeah. That, that the wish is expressed and you've willed the means in part in the creation of the bank mm -hmm. and the means must respond with what it can achieve. Yeah. No, no, my question is simply... Uh, Yep. Yeah, got another supplementary. That's Final fine. point? Yep, that's fine. That's You're okay. Good. Right. Dean, lock up. I just to move from the, the sort of macro to the micro, from, from the mission investments to investments in private sector business. Will investments in individual companies be merit based, or will the bank also have a, a regional allocation uh, in terms of investments to make sure that each region of Scotland gets a, a roughly pro rata share, or will it be purely merit based? It's, to be honest, it's, at the moment the assumption is merit-based, but we will have to make sure that we pay due attention to stimulating the right kind of demand across the country, because there is no desire for us simply to serve the central belt, which kind of came up earlier. Um, so I think we will, that, that it will be absolutely critical to monitor the levels of investment that are being made in the different regions in Scotland. But at this juncture, um, the, the, we, we're not trying to kind of force feed certain mm. regions, it would be um, trying to encourage the right kind of demand and, and feed that demand. And, and looking at the book of investments, will there be a, an ROI or a target, a hurdle target established uh, early on to, to make sure investments are uh, creative? Yeah, I mean, the, 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 just for the points of doubt, the, the, the bank is being set up to make a return on capital. We haven't set out precisely the numbers that are associated with that yet. We have to also take into account the other comments that have been made around the societal benefit too. Uh, but it is, the intention is that the bank will make a return on capital. The longer, some of the issues relating to long-term patient capital will be interesting because in some of those examples, there will, will not be a, 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 an existing market to make the comparisons um, in terms of returns. But yeah, but that's, that is work in progress to set out precisely what those returns need to be. Good. Uh, OK, Mr McFarlane. Then. The British Business Bank has some very clear numbers that it uses, which are from the British Venture Capital Association about what expected returns are. I just wanted to underline, in the bill, it makes crystal clear that it is expected that this organisation will not be cash neutral mm. in terms of its costs until 2023. So there's going to be red ink spilled in those annual reporting accounts every single year till 2023. So that's why I said at the beginning, if you want to be long-term patient capital, you have to have long-term patient investors. Mm. Okay. Thank you. Okay, uh, briefly, Mr. Brewer. Well, really just to, to underline that point, coming back to the gap that we talked about in the first place, um, a lot of um, venture capital and private equity investors have time horizons on their funds. They've got investors standing behind them who want to see a return in five to seven years and uh, sometimes to the point where the fund has a hard close at the end, end date and they have to realise those investments in that time scale. It's very important that in setting its ROI, the National Investment Bank doesn't have these time pressures because that influences investment behaviour 
in ways which I think would work against the outcomes that you're seeking to achieve. OK, thanks so much. Um, right, I've got a few questions just myself um, before I'll be the final questions, I think. Um, just carrying on the, the point on missions, um, I, I think the question I have is how distinct are these or is it possible that they actually overlap with each other? Because looking at the German, what we're told, the German investment bank, they've got a, a couple, for example, would be climate change and the environment and globalisation and technical progress. And I mean, I would see these as potentially overlapping quite a lot. So do, do you see the the missions as distinct, so this bit of money will go for that mission, this bit of money will go for that mission, or is it more like we are looking at all of these missions and this investment fits a number of them? I th I, well, I'll, I'll start, maybe and others can, can then join in. You, you know, I think we, sh we shouldn't be setting out to try and make the, the very hard and fast rules around this. The point is the missions are the direction of travel to make sure that we do the right things in the economy. One, one of the, uh, certainly, uh, I, I've mentioned earlier that we've been in dialogue with other uh, national investment banks. We've got to be careful not to try and be like any one of them in particular, because we have to be bespoke for our own specific needs in, in Scotland. I mean, KFW in particular is a very interesting uh, case study, but of course it's been around since the, after the Second World War, is a absolutely huge institution, um, and I don't think it's probably the best place for us to look for most of our learnings. And I think in other countries which are similarly small advanced economic nations, I think we see um, probably better comparisons. Uh, there will inevitably be um, examples of investments we make that do serve um, different missions, whether it be a crossover between carbon neutrality and automation. So some of this is inevitable. But I think what the, 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 the purpose of the missions is to give us kind of guide rails to, to allow the investment strategy to unfold within the operationally independent bank. OK, uh, Mr Brewer. Uh, yes, I mean, on, on that, the, the bank's resources come in two forms. One is the capital and the other is the people. What you absolutely need is people who have the, the knowledge, experience and capability to have a real impact through investing in the missions. Um, and I'd be, yeah, I, I can't anticipate what the bank would do, but I'd be surprised if it made hard allocations of capital between the missions um, because it's about uh, getting the maximum overall outcome. But the people who bring the expertise in these will all speak to each other and where they overlap, I suspect, um, you know, overlapping investment is unlikely to be an issue. OK, thanks. I mean, another word that's been used has been ethical, and that's been mentioned already this morning, and uh, the thought is that the bank uh, would invest in an ethical way. Uh, but that word ethical, I think, is difficult, um, or at least people understand different things by it, let's say. Um, so, so what do you understand by the bank investing in an ethical way? Oh, Anyone? Whoever, no, Mr. No, McFarlane. A good place to start is the UN Sustainable Development Goals, which across the investment industry now are becoming. So there's a thing called the PRI, Principles for Responsible Investment, promulgated by the UN. They fit in the Sustainable Development Goals, which I'm sure are, are very familiar here. Um, then there's the ethics of upholding the law, um, the questions about um, openness in society. And I think the, the, the point is that to have a bank where there's a silo of carbon neutral, a silo of this, a silo of that, <clears throat> to answer your earlier question, it's not possible, and it ties in with this. The shareholder makes it clear, uh, partly client, partly shareholder, this is, these are the outcomes I desire, or we desire. Evidence your journey, your path towards that, and evidence the manner in which you're conducting yourself. Um, I mean, the classic example is that um, some religious traditions prohibit interest, Others don't. Um, different religious traditions have different attitudes towards some health products and others. So, you know, in investment people are very familiar with dealing to the client's mandate. I think what's going to happen here is that if the Scottish, yeah, the Scottish ministers can say, well, the UN Sustainable Development Goals are a really good broad framework, plus these other things, that will help a lot guide the board of this institution as to how to conduct itself. Mm. But you can imagine a situation where someone's going to stand up in Parliament and say, you know, you're claiming to be ethical and this particular decision is not ethical. Um, I mean, is the answer just that, well, that will be reviewed at the end of the year? Is well, it's, it's unanswerable because then we're not dealing, we're dealing with axiomatic assumptions about ethics. We're not dealing about an investment question. 
Well, one thing I can say is that we will document an ethical code for the bank. So that will be documented. That will not prevent arguments about whether it's been followed or not. OK. I'll, I think that will be one we come back to. I'll leave that just now. Uh, just finally, to wrap up, really, um, on some kind of practical questions, the, the time table, I think one or two people have suggested that we're, we've got quite a tight timetable to get the legislation passed, get things into effect, get the board in place. Uh, are, have you got feelings about that? Are you relaxed about where we are? Probably best Let's to answer, answer that yes. question. Um, uh, speaking to all of my colleagues involved in the project, there is a there is an awareness that this is a tight timetable, but there is also um, a degree of confidence that we can we can push through. Uh, the first vote would be scheduled for September, probably a second in November, any final vote in March. Um, in parallel with that voting schedule, um, state aid will be going through. Um, it's independent, but it, but but not unrelated, um, and so we um, we're, we're reasonably confident on the. the the bill that we'll get to Royal Assent uh, by this time next year. Of course, in parallel, we have got to build a bank, not just get a bill through. And we've got to get the people involved. We've got to get the, the business set up. We're going through detailed design authority meetings at the moment. Um, the process of looking for a chair is just about to be kicked off. Finding a chair will then uh, will then unfold into finding the rest of the board and finding the chief executive and other senior executives. Um, I don't take it for granted that that will be a straightforward process. I think, um, I, you know, let's see. I'm hopeful that if we get on with it, get going now, that we can follow through and get this done in the schedule that I've, I've just referred to. But it's not easy. Um, there's some unknowns. But I, m my concern is more about just getting the right people, because the organisation, the institution, will ultimately be as good as the people that run it. OK, thanks so much. Okay. Right. Well, thank you very much to all of our panel for coming in today, and uh, I'll now suspend the session to allow a changeover of witnesses. Thank you.
Well, we now come to uh, the next uh, part of the item on the agenda, and that is our second panel of witnesses on the Scottish National Investment Bank Bill. And first of all, I'll ask any members to declare any interest they may have. Uh, Angela Constance. Thank you very much, Convener. In the interest of transparency, I would like to declare that I'm in the process of joining the Board of Commonweal. It's um, a non-financial interest, but I thought, uh, given that one of our uh, witnesses is from that organisation, that I should declare that for today's purposes. Thank you very much. And with that, I'll turn to today's witnesses. We have uh, Robin McAlpine, Director of Commonweal, um, Ailey Dixon, Policy and Parliamentary Manager of Engender, and Ray Perman, from, uh, who is a Fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh. So welcome to all three of you today. Um, if I might just start um, about the rationale of the bank, which is to improve Scotland's innovation performance uh, and enhancing SME access to finance. Um, what do the panel think of that uh, purpose or rationale? and also whether or not you're satisfied with the objectives of the bank as set out in Section 2 of the Bill. So I don't know who would like to start on that. I'm quite happy to start. Robert. Um, yes, I mean, I think we, we are very happy with the Bill. So this has been a project that's been very close to our heart for a long way through, and we've been following it very closely. I, I, I have strong confidence in the way it's been taken forward. The most important thing for me is not to see this excessively from the producer side, so the objectives in terms of, um, you know, this is what we are going to do it is useful. The important thing is that it must be demand-led and that we have to encourage people to come forward. So the objectives are broadly right, and what we have to do is make sure that there's sufficient demand in Scotland to bring these objectives through. And partly that's about signalling that these objectives are the things that, they are, that the bank is looking to support. So, I mean, all the way through this, I've been quite clear that missions will change and adapt and must be, um, uh, uh, and must be interpreted and, um, openly uh, as they go along. The one thing which I would have liked to have seen a little more emphasis on was lending to public sector. So uh, assisting the finance of public infrastructure, working with local authorities, housing associations and others. Um, I think there's a couple of times when the wording at the moment slightly implies that this is going to be just an SME bank a little more than I would have liked to have seen. But broadly, yes, we are quite happy with this. And the key thing is, um, like I say, it's about stimulating demand and it's about being helpful and flexible and developing the right suite of lending to make sure that that demand, first of all, comes forward. And second of all, that it signals the kinds of projects and the sort of work that we are hoping people will come forward with. Okay. Um, Ellie Dixon. Yeah. Um, we are slightly more concerned about the objects that are listed within the bill at the moment, not necessarily because there is anything wrong with those that are listed, but because they are primarily focused on the economic aspects of the bank, the, the core economic aspects of the bank, rather than the social well-being and environmental impact that the bank is supposed to have. The bank is supposed to be about doing something different. It's supposed to be about releasing untapped potential that does not translate into the objects as they're currently listed. And we don't believe that without, so we, we believe that without an equality and non-discrimination objective, there, will, there won't be any radical change in the way that things are currently done in the economic development field. Right, Ray Perman. Um, I think our position is set out in the written submission that we gave. We're broadly supportive of the objectives of the bank. Uh, we think they should be clear. We would disagree with Robin McAlpine on the investment in infrastructure because I think a decision was taken very early not to incorporate uh, Scottish Futures Fund, which does infrastructure into the bank. So there should be a clear division between those two. Uh, I don't think it's going to do any lending. It is an investor, although it's called a bank, it is an investor rather than a bank. So broadly, yes, we would think the objectives are clear. Um, we would, we have, reservations about the mission-led uh, side of things, um, uh, agreeing with what Alan McFarlane was saying in the previous session, that it should start off with a simple mission, a single mission, and maybe build on that later, rather than starting with a weight of expectations which might be difficult to fulfil. All right, thank you. And I'll now come to Dean Lockhart. 
Thank you very much. Uh, I asked this question in the previous um, panel. We've seen other policy announcements and initiatives from the Scottish Government to supply capital and supply finance to the Scottish economy, but there hasn't been a sufficient demand, uh, something uh, Robin McAlpine referred to earlier. Um, it strikes me the bank, in giving answers, thought that it could play a role in increasing that demand. I'm, I'm not entirely convinced by that because they, 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 they're not going to originate, they're, they're not going to go out there and find business. Their job is to uh, supply uh, money to business that is found by other agencies. So I'd, I'd be interested to get your views in terms of overall how we can stimulate that demand for finance and then uh, how other agencies can deliver uh, businesses to the bank in order for the bank to finance it. Um, if I could answer that, I, I think you're absolutely right, and, and Benny did allude to this, that um, the bank will not originate deals itself and therefore has to work very closely with those agencies and also with private sector bodies like the commercial banks, for example, in bringing fee people forward to stimulate demand to take up the capital. So important links between the uh, existing economic agencies uh, and other stakeholders and the bank uh, must be made at the beginning. But if I can just give you an example from, uh, from the UK and the British Business Bank, I was chair of um, an advisory group to the Department of Business in London for eight years, and we set up in the uh, sort of 2005 an organisation which was called Capital for Enterprise, which was to do the sort of things which the British Business Bank was doing now. It didn't have a particularly grab-me name. It had a pretty high profile within the investment industry, but generally among, among companies it was an unknown quantity. Merely remaining, uh, renaming that as the British Business Bank, now uh, the British Business Bank has expanded those activities, but merely renaming it as a British Business Bank, a much clearer name, gave a visibility to the activities that were going on, which was important. And I think that just the publicity around renaming what is the Scottish uh, Investment Bank currently as Scottish National Investment Bank, and then building on that foundation to expand could have a positive effect. Okay. Um, I would agree that there's some work to be done around awareness raising, and there will be a role for the precursor funds to do that. I would disagree that we should be looking at what we already have and building on it. Um, the, the point is, the current structure of economic development in Scotland is not reaching everybody. We know Ms Constance already referenced the, the potential GVA of women's business uh, in this country. And we know that that does not necessarily come from sectors which are prioritised within the government's uh, economic growth strategy. So it has to also be about looking at other sectors, other ways of doing it, other types of businesses. Um, and we dismantling some of those additional barriers that are in place for people who access, who are looking to access finance but may not have the particular um, traditional style of business. They may be working in childcare or care sector. There may not be a huge amount of growth potential, so they may not even they may be discouraged from even seeking funding in the first place from the private actors that already exist and the current public actors. Okay. And. Yes, I mean, we were driven developing these proposals early on by conversations largely with a lot of small businesses, uh, medium-sized businesses. And one of the things we kept coming across again was, fair or not, and I think there's a lot of fairness in it, they were quite scared of banks. They, they, they saw the banks as predatory. This was a period in which a lot of these small businesses had come out the wrong side of lending arrangements with banks. On top of which, we talked to others who, to my eyes, had vi viable business proposals, but the kind of lending horizons, the periods that the banks were willing to lend, the terms they were lending, willing to lend on were not conducive to encouraging these businesses to come forward. So the first thing that we thought was important was to say, here is a bank whose sole purpose is to support you. It's not a profit generating bank. We are not going to extract profit. Our only, exist, our only purpose in existing is to help your business grow and become better, to be long-term partners with you. Now, that messaging, simply to send out that message, I think will have a positive effect on a lot of businesses who are nervous about bank lending and who are not coming forward for that reason. Um, we would suggest that those concerns are probably even stronger in the social enterprise and, and cooperative sectors, which are sectors we should want to grow 
grow substantially in Scotland. And the other important factor here, and this is when we come to the, there's a fund here, there's a grant set here, there's a, a pocket of money here. This is a bank which should be here in 100 years. This should become to Scotland what national investment banks become to Germany, a fundamental permanent part of their economy, which people assume will always be there to support the kind of long term developmental activity. So as well as getting the lending terms right, as well as creating the right lending horizons for small businesses, as well as making all these things work for it, the message that we want this to be how this bank works will be something which will build demand, and I genuinely believe that to be the case. Um, we've, we're already talking to people, small businesses, um, and we're saying to them, you know, this is coming. You know, these opportunities are coming. And people are going, ah. So I genuinely think one of the most important things this does is it says there is a place you can build your business through time, which you can trust, which will work with you as a partner, and you should look again at ideas and thoughts that you had in the past and were perhaps nervous to come forward with. And I think that's one of the first and most important things that the bank can do. Thanks very much. If I can follow up with uh, one specific uh, supplemental, we heard the evidence from the previous panel that the investment policy of the bank will not will will be merit based on an individual case by case basis. There won't be any concept of a pro rata distribution of investment across across Scotland in terms of region. I'd like to get your views on whether you think that is is the right approach. I, I think it is absolutely the right approach. There is a danger in a pro rata allocation. And we saw this um, in the UK generally with the regional development, uh, regional venture capital funds, which were set up in the early 2000s um, on the lines that you suggested, that is, regions were given an allocation of money. What happened was that some regions ran out of money. They had more demand than they had supply. Some regions had a shortfall in demand. And in some cases, in one particular case, I think in the southwest of England, the costs of administering the fund were greater than the amount invested. Now, the National Audit Office uh, produced a coruscating report on the running of the regional development funds, the regional venture capital funds. Uh, and so I think that the money should be held centrally, but it should go where the demand is. Now, uh, Stimulating demand in those areas which are not traditionally coming forward with uh, investment propositions is a very important job and should be done. But to actually arbitrarily uh, allocate the money in advance of seeing what the demand is, I think is going to be counterproductive. Can I just agree with that? Um, there's a theme that I'll probably mention a couple of times here, which is sometimes people see this bank as a one-stop shop for fixing everything. It's a source of funding. It should be giving the right kind of packages to the right kind of projects. It's not inventing the projects. It's not directing the projects. It's not traveling around the country saying, we're going to invest here. It's got to be demand driven. The purpose of the tasks of getting different regions of Scotland to increase the demand pool is a different task. It's for, the, it's for local authorities, that's for Scottish Enterprise and, and its local arms. Um, and in terms of some lending, and again, um, not just quite yet, one thing at a time except that, but you don't really want small businesses borrowing largely, I mean, actually small businesses borrowing largely from a, a central bank in in, in you know, the centre of the town. We need to have a banking network, a local banking network, which creates the kind of support that small businesses need. If you're running a hairdresser, you need to cash up. You need a relationship with a good banking network. And one of the things that we would argue is do not assume that every micro business will be going to the Scottish National Investment Bank for lending. It's more likely that we could do with a better local banking network. We're going to come forward with proposals mm. for a mutual or public local banking network, both to sustain... Um, banking services and communities in Scotland which are losing them, but also for the sole purpose that long-term relationships with a close nearby bank is the best solution for a lot of small, um, small, lot of small businesses. And the National Investment Bank can play a very important role in supporting and capitalising that, but it can't do everything. Now, I absolutely agree that Scotland has got a problem with differential investment in different regions of Scotland. I mean, I, I see this everywhere I go. And what I think would be very important is the bank does monitor where regionally its investment goes, but it must be driven by demand. And if there is a demand failure in a region in Scotland and people aren't coming forward, 
it's the rest of the public agencies which are supposed to be working in economic development. They need to address that. The bank has to be lending on the basis of business cases that are brought to it. And if they're not coming, that's not a failure in the bank. And the, uh, the only thing I'd add, uh, we don't have a position on whether it should take a regional approach, but the question would be how would merit be assessed? Okay. okay. Thank you. Uh, Gordon MacDonald. Thanks so much, Convener. Uh, before I go on to my own questions, uh, on, on the subject of demand, uh, I was reading the um, RSE's report from 2014, the supply of high growth capital for emerging high potential companies in Scotland. And it was saying banking regulations have introduced more stringent risk criteria, reduced access for small companies to conventional overdraft or term lending arrangements, and has had significant effect on the capitalisation of early stage companies. And as a result, growth aspirations have had to depend uh, on equity investment. So, you know, is that the gap that the new Scottish National Investment Bank is trying to fill? And is the criteria that was highlighted back in 2014 still applicable today? And that's what's suppressing demand. I, th I think the criteria is still applicable today. I don't think that position has eased any. It'll be, I imagine, one of the gaps which the National Investment Bank will be trying to fill. Um, just to emphasise, it's going to be an investment bank, generally. It will make equity investments. Mm -hmm. It may do some lending. Uh, Scottish Enterprise and the Scottish Investment Bank at the moment do a minority. There are a small amount of their investment is in lending rather than uh, in equity, in investment, long-term patient capital. Um, I imagine that the vast bulk of the money which the National Investment Bank invests will be equity. It will be patient capital. It will not be lending where you need to get the money back, and sometimes you need to get it back quite quickly. It will be patient capital. Yeah. And um, if I just add to that, um, just I think that's exactly the kinds of gaps, the kind of barriers, the kind of parts of the lending or equity environment where there are problems. But I do want to emphasise here that, again, what I've found quite exciting about this is you know, we've been working this for five years and we've got quite a clear idea in our head what we think the kind of projects that might come forward would be. What I found really encouraging is we keep talking to projects that we didn't realise would potentially come forward. And this is what I think is really, I, I, I would expect there'll be quite an interesting and diverse range of different projects that come forward, of different um, enterprises that come forward. And these are some of the kind of barriers which I think can be addressed. I'll just give you one other example. We were talking to a project which um, is a company, a business, which is looking to expand. And it just so happens that at the time they were looking to expand, their bank, because it had been burned in a couple of things, had just pulled out of investments on retail properties. So they said, we're not investing, we're just blanket not investing, we've been stung too much by overpriced commercial property investments. But they were looking at a, a specific property which had a very strong business case. And the bank had just said, it's because, you know, we're a big bank, we're just not doing this category just now, and they couldn't get the lending. So what are they going to do, close their bank account, go to another bank, or just say, well, we won't bother then? Or, so it's, it's, there's a wide range of different barriers why people don't come forward. And a lot of it's to do with confidence and other things to do with straightforward strategic decisions by commercial banks at any given moment. And there's a range of different reasons why um, there is potential which is not coming forward and looking for the investment that will help it grow. Those are the kinds of examples. But, I mean, I'm still coming across them now. We keep coming up against things and they say, well, we didn't do it because of this. And we say, really? That, that, that's surprising. We would have thought you would have been more advanced in coming forward and, and getting lending. So, I, I mean, I think there are genuine barriers. I don't think you'll talk to an awful lot of medium-sized enterprises who will say everything about our equity and lending environment is exactly as we would like it. And this will be a part of filling a, a hole in that jigsaw. What, what, what do you hope the impact will be on the Scottish economy of this uh, two billion investment over ten years? Well, but this is the point. We would like to see this be substantially larger. And so, one of the reasons why, and just to be clear, the one of the reasons why I think it's quite important that it's not just an SME lending bank is SME lending is quite risky. SMEs in, across the, the portfolio are quite risky. Um, as far as I'm concerned, where we should be moving to as quickly as possible is to ensure that, first of all, we need Treasury dispensation for this.
but to make sure that the bank's lending is not counted against Scotland's public sector borrowing requirement. And as soon as that happens, then you can start to leverage additional capital, for example, from pension funds. And for me, what I would like to see is a situation where you are aiming to have a loan book or an or a, or a equity book, which involves perhaps 70%, which are housing, public infrastructure. These are really safe, really solid, profitable investments, which means that the 30%, which is SME lending, you can be much more, you can take much more chance with. Two billion, if we get this right, for an economy like Scotland, two billion pounds is, over 10 years is not transformative. It should be more than that. But you start somewhere and you do something. And the first step, we've been working quite closely with the team developing this. And I think they're right in saying the first thing that we need to do as a nation is demonstrate that there genuinely is demand. So when hopefully eventually we go to Treasury and ask for a dispensation, which will enable the bank to capitalise more fully and more effectively, we'll be able to go and do that with evidence that there is demand and that Scotland does have an economy which is capable of absorbing that kind of advanced investment. So um, everything has to start somewhere. And I think this is a, a good starting point. We are much more ambitious for its future than that. We think there's a very large scope to bring in pension funds, a number of other investors. And once you do that, you're looking at a scale of 10 times plus what the bank can lend. Um, when we get there, you'll start to have a bank that's changing an economy fundamentally. Um, we've taken no position on whether the two billion is sufficient or insufficient. What will be more important for women and gender equality more generally is that um, is how that two billion is utilised, where it's utilised. Um, this committee has recommended in the past that care and childcare be designated as part of infrastructure spend. Doing so would um, have a long-term enabling effect for women's economic participation, as well as having a direct benefit for their current um, high prevalence within those industries and the pay, their take-home pay um, as a result. So. It's not so much for us about how much, but where and how you take the long-term view, but also the wide view about where you free up participation in other parts of the market that you're not necessarily looking at. Okay, um, I think it, the bank has capacity to make a substantial difference to the Scottish economy, particularly in uh, not only new company for, formation. We do pretty well in Scotland at starting new companies, but as our colleague was saying earlier on, in growing companies to um, a reasonable size and importantly in keeping the ownership and decision making in those companies in Scotland, um, then we have done less well. Uh, and part of the reason for that is, is access to finance. It's not the whole reason, but it is part of the reason. The Scottish National Investment Bank will most commonly invest alongside the private sector as a co-investor. Um, and, and its capacity there is to catalyse uh, a lot of private sector funds uh, and to make an impact much bigger than the amount of money which government puts into it. Okay. Um, my last point is um, a question I raised uh, with the earlier panel about operating costs. Um, RAC had raised a question over the 25 million, which was the midpoint. Um, and I just want to know uh, what the RSE's views are and how they justify the criticism that they had. Well, there, there were, I think, a couple of reasons we came to that conclusion. One is just pure arithmetic. Um, the bank's going to have something like 100 people, uh, 25 million um, is a quarter of a million per person. That seems a very high figure to us. But also a comparison with the operating costs of the British Business Bank, which from memory I think are about 50% higher for a bank which is over twice the size. So it did seem to be a, uh, a very high expectation of costs for this bank. One particular thing stood out for us, which is the sponsoring department, which I think in the implementation plan says are going to have 40 people within the civil service, not in the bank, costing four million a year. Mm -hmm. That seemed to us rather excessive for monitoring a bank which is only going to have 100 people. In terms of, in terms of uh, rate of return on its investments, what, what sort of level of rate of return would it require in order to cover its costs? 
I, I, I haven't done the arithmetic, but you, you would need to, I think the British Business Bank has a target rate of return of um, its cost of capital, which at the moment is, I think, 2.5% or maybe even a bit less than that, and, and achieves just more than that. But it's important that the rate of return, I mean, it, 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 I think it would be good discipline for the bank in the long term to at least cover its costs, its running costs, and its cost of capital. Um, but it shouldn't be looking to, to earn a commercial rate of return. If you take the British Business Bank as a model, it invests alongside the private sector at the same level of risk. That is, if, a, if an investment fails, both the private sector and the public sector take the same hit. The public sector does not take uh, more of a loss than the private sector. That is a lesson which was learned from very early investments where the government did that. But going forward, then, the British Business Bank for successful investments would expect to earn a return which covers its own costs and covers its cost of capital, mm -hmm. but it allows the private sector to make an enhanced return. So part of its commercial return, it, it cedes to the private sector as an investment to bring more private sector funds into uh, the total investment of the British Business Bank. Now, I would imagine that the Scottish National Investment Bank would want to look at a similar sort of framework. It might not be exactly the same. But in the long term, and uh, Alan McFarlane was saying, I think 2023, before the expectation yeah. of break-even, in the long term, it should look to cover its own costs uh, and cover its cost of capital. But being a patient investor means not maximising the return it gets from the investments. Mm. You, you said that uh, it should largely model the British Business Bank. Um, the B British Business Bank has substantially increased its rate of return over recent years. Over the last four years, it's an average of 3%. Yeah. But 2017-18, it was 4.7%. And 2016-17, it was 41 so even taking that 3%, by 2023, in my calculations, its costs would be covered, the Scottish well, the, National Investment the, Bank. Um, I don't think you can go on individual year figures because there That's may have been... the average of 3% over four years. But those two figures you gave for the higher return, it mm -hmm. may have been impacted by the fact that there was a particularly successful yeah. investment sold that year. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, other years, may, you may have a lower rate of return mm -hmm. because... Um, you don't get successful investments mm -hmm. in that year. But taking um, a longer-term view, uh, the bank should aim to cover its cost of capital and its own running costs, but not to make an enhanced return. Otherwise, I don't think it is probably... It is not fulfilling the expectations of it in taking risk and in putting capital into areas which currently are undercapitalised. OK, thanks so much. Right, Andy Whiteman. Uh, thanks very much, um, convener. Um, just following up a point that Ray Perman raised um, earlier about <coughs> loans. I mean, the bill makes clear that the bank is empowered to provide loans. Uh, the question as to how much um, the bank should make loans as opposed to investment is not, I don't think, indicated anywhere. So your views and your response to the first question about effectively not making loans. I mean, those are just your views. I mean, we don't have any indication as to what is expected. Well, it, I mean, making loans is a... Um, it's an expensive business if you're doing it on a micro scale because you need to process those loans, you need to monitor their loans, you need to get the money back. And I don't think the bank is going to be set up to be able to do that on any big uh, scale. It, it can't compete, and it shouldn't compete with the commercial banks. Um, I wholly take Robin's point that commercial banks have not done themselves any favours in the way that they have behaved, particularly towards small businesses, but um, generally in their activities over the last 10 or 20 years. But expecting the Scottish National Investment Bank to replace that bank lending is unrealistic, I think. 
Where it could make a difference is in areas of lending, but quite spe specific areas, where there is a deficiency at the moment. And the example that I gave was the um, Scottish Growth Fund, which is uh, essentially a mezzanine fund. It, it, it makes loans, but it makes loans in specific cases for growing companies. And I think that has been quite successful. And the, the Scottish National Investment Bank might want to build on that example. OK, thanks. Just to see, the world's filled with countries that have large mutual banking networks. The hard private commercial banking model that we've got in the UK has done nothing but create risk, massive profits, and all sorts of problems. And to say, that, you know, they haven't done themselves in favours. I mean, they've acted absolutely criminally in the last 15 years, um, some of the commercial banks. So what I think is important is that we have a sense of scale. This bank is not going to transfer everything straight away. Um, it's two billion over ten years. That is not going to change everything. What I want to emphasise this is the first step in creating an institution which should exist many generations, as far as I'm concerned. And where it goes to, I think, is something we should be much more open-minded about, and that we may have a quite different kind of. Um, lending framework into the future. And as for equity versus loans, what I absolutely agree with is, you, I said it earlier on, micro businesses and even most small businesses, they benefit from being near their banking. They benefit from being close to people. And one of the biggest failures, I think, in, in, in the banking network is the breaking of the long-term relationship between small businesses and lending managers in a lot of banks. Um, they were a supportive and positive relationship which helped small businesses grow, and small businesses are losing a trust in that because of what they've read about how the banks operate. Um, what I keep saying over and over again, so the first thing to say is this is a bank. This is bank must operate like like a commercial bank, if it starts subsidising loan rates to below something that looks roughly broadly like a fair market, it will get into trouble with European Union competition laws. So it cannot be heavily subsidising interest rates to increase or decrease um, rates of return. What it can do is create a suite of lending and equity investment packages which are tailored to the demand that is coming forward. So, for example, a housing association or a small community housing project may wish to borrow, if it can, mortgage style over 30 years. They would find that quite difficult to do that with existing commercial banks. We've modelled the costing of this, and a Scottish National Investment Bank could lend over 30 years at rates which would comfortably come in under European competition rule problems, but would enable mass public and public rental house building in Scotland, not by subsidising, but by giving different forms of loan. And other kinds of loans which would say, and again, there are examples of these, other kinds of loans which say, we think you've got a solid business proposal, you're a medium-sized business, we recognise that your investment will be heavy, and the time it takes for you to start to grow that such that you will get the returns may be a little longer, so we can look at a phased package which would see loan repayments start a bit lower and climb over the co over the, the relationship period with the with the enterprise. So what I think is another thing, sorry, to pick up, for example, for gender, it may very well be that the bank does say that we will give some weighting to certain public goods. So, for example, we want to see more enterprises which are led by women, and so they may say we will give a slight weighting to enterprises that come forward that do certain things which are particularly good for the economy. But they must be commercial loans. They must still be behaving roughly in line with the broad market. So what I think is the most important thing is that this bank listens incredibly carefully to its customers and its potential customers, and it devises either its lending or its equity into packages which are best suited for the enterprises and the kinds of projects that it's lending to. And once it does that, it will compete, not by being cheaper, but being better and by being more in line to the needs of these business, because it's not profit maximising, it's development maximising. And that is where the value comes. OK, okay thanks for that. Um, also, just picking up on a point I, I raised at the earlier panel, and um, uh, Rob McAlpine has already touched on this, um, Benny Higgins made clear that the bank is not prohibited from lending to the public sector, but it's not anticipated uh, it would. And I think that view is probably predicated on the idea that it might lend to existing public organisations 
um, such as local government or, or, or other public organisations. And yet we have state-owned enterprises like Swedish Vattenfall that's been around 100 years. The idea that we wouldn't fund enterprises that are designed to transform the energy system just because of an ownership model seems to be a bit strange. And we've also got one of the biggest um, forms of patient capital in the private sector, which is pension funds, who play a huge role in investing in housing um, across Europe. So I just wonder the panel's views on the scope and the role of the bank to invest in public-led um, enterprise. Just what I was saying, it's a very big opportunity. Okay. Um, the public sector is a very reliable repair of its loans. It's a very stable repair of its loans. And uh, just to pick that one example, um, I'm not going to be applying to run a bank, I can promise you, but where I, one of the first things that I would be looking at is an enormous scope for patient lending to public house building in Scotland. I say again, we've costed it. You can build um, very, very uh, high spec houses, rent them at below market rates. And if you borrow over 30 years, you can do this with no public subsidy. This is the big gap, which I believe we have in public rental house building. We still have to subsidize every house because nobody does mortgage style lending for those kind of large public sector housing developments. Now, if that's not a mission that Scotland should really be cracking on with, I really don't know what is. So I, I genuinely don't know why anyone would be dogmatic about who you're lending to. If okay. someone comes forward with a proposal and says this transforms Scotland, in the way you want it to, why not lend to them? I don't have any problem with the Scottish National Investment Bank lending to public sector organisations if, if the proposition is a good one. Okay, thanks for that. Moving on to this question on, on, on governance. Um, uh, Ray Perman, in the RSE's response, you are quite concerned about the role of this advisory group, which I was discussing with um, the previous uh, panel. Um, and they were concerned that it would inter uh, inappropriately interfere with the workings of the bank. But the way it's anticipated is it would be an advisory panel for ministers. But the, <coughs> the policy memorandum does make clear that this is anticipated that the chair of the advisory board is intent would, would be a non-executive member of the board. So I'm just wondering if you can say a little bit more to elaborate. You draw our attention to the 2017 and 18 responses that you made. I haven't read the, them, but if you could, I, I think. Our problem is twofold. One is uh, efficiency, um, and and Benny uh, went into this in some detail that um, having two people interfering in the running of the bank is not an efficient way to run it. But our other response, and perhaps our larger concern, is accountability. Um, what is the chain of accountability if you have an <coughs> advisory group you have the board of the bank, you have the minister, you have the executive of the bank, and you have at least one common person uh, on the board and the advisory committee. The, the chain of responsibility um, should go from the executive through the board to the shareholders in the shape of the minister, uh, and that should be clear so that uh, we know where responsibility lies, where accountability lies. I think it, it blurs things if we have an advisory group advising the minister where one member of that group is also a member of the okay, board. If, if we just take that one point and accept yeah. that for the sake of argument, that's probably yeah. not a good idea. Um, Benny Higgins did say early on about emissions, for example, he said carbon neutrality is an obvious one. He talked about automation, demographics. Uh, he also mentioned social housing. Um, do you not see it as a benefit? If you, I mean, if you were Scottish ministers and um, Parliament has no role in this bill in approving any emissions, so you're, you're doing this yourself, um, do you not see a role for ministers having an advisory group to advise ministers on how they should frame their mission instructions? That, that's, that's entirely for the minister, yes. I mean, if the minister wants that, that's fine. So you have no f fundamental objection to no, this? No, no, it's not that... It's not the, <coughs> It's not the group advising the minister that we have the objection. It is the it is the blurring of the accountability of the responsibility okay. of the board. Yes, that is the problem. Okay, that's very helpful to clarify objection. Um, I just want to pick up on the the some of the, some of the some of the confusion I think has come around what the advisory board has anticipated it will do, um, and how it will be structured differently to the bank's executive board. 
there is a question about expertise, particularly given the underrepresentation of women in the finance sector and in economics, and um, women and others with multiple characteristics and multiple disadvantages. So there may be a role for an advisory board which picks up on some of that different expertise that is not captured within an executive board. Um, it also comes back to something Mazzucato says in her paper around there may be a role for civil society around consensus building and missions. And the bank will need to have a considerable amount of social license for it to deliver public or to um, invest public, public funds. So there, I think there is a role for an advisory board. I do agree that we need to kind of crystallise who will be on it, how it will be structured differently and what that role is. So this is the one area. I, I'm very happy with the legislation. I think it's broadly fine. A few tweaks. We didn't put an awful lot of comments in, and I've got high confidence in the team that's doing the building work. So we're very relaxed about this. I, I think it's going well. The one area we would have got, definitely gone further is in the governance. So when we did our first proposals for this, so when we wrote this down the first time, the advisory group, and I'd still like to see this changed personally, the advisory group, the dotted line was not into the ministers, but straight into the board. And it was advisory, not instructive. It's an advisory board, just like the ministers cannot, while they are the shareholder, this is a limited company, and the board has the legal responsibility for all of the successful operation of the company. Um, the minister can fire the board if they're not happy, but they are not executive members of governing the bank. Um, what we wanted to see was the advisory group feeding straight in there, and it was a very specific purpose. We had, in, we had originally proposed it as a tripartite advisory group picking up the kind of broad missions, whereby a third of them would be representatives of medium-sized enterprises. So this was about the, the, the people who are borrowing, the people who are approaching the bank, giving them a clear voice on how the bank should be run, a third of them being for our, in ours, local authorities, housing associations, public sector bodies, and a third to represent the public good element of it, including gender, including trade unions and things like this. So this was about a balancing. The board is going to have a very strong fiduciary duty to operate like a bank, a proper bank. And they will have to be hard and make decisions which say, we can't do this because lovely as it is, it's not going to meet our lending criteria, our financial criteria. Um, to balance that, we had wanted to see an advisory board which was all about the customer effect. The cut, this was a customer board. These are the people, the customers being Scotland as a whole, the, the private sector and the public sector. Um, and it was really about the, I, I think maybe the kind of the fear that the banks are sometimes a little bit tenured when it comes to fiduciary duty. And it was to say to them, you do, it was to have a regular place to say, we kind of represent the people you're supposed to be lending to. And we are telling you that this thing that you're doing isn't helping us or could be done better, or this would be a great thing to try. So, um, I, I mean, I take, I take conflicts of interest and in, I'm not particularly bothered about the exact who's sitting where, but the model of saying that the, advice, sorry, the board of the bank should have a direct line to a group of people who are saying, we represent the people you should be serving and we want to give you some advice. It is now for you to take that advice or not take advice because you are a board of a, of a limited company. Okay. Uh, and just to conclude, um, there's a variety of views on this question. We'll explore them further. But do you think whatever provision is made for such an advisory board should be in, uh, embedded in the bill or just left to the board and ministers to work out? For me, I always have the concern that, um, and don't take this wrong, long-term initiatives like this need to be protected by, from politicians. So don't, don't take that personally. It's just the case that the point of this bank is 10, 20, 30 year time horizons. And the point of politicians with the best will in the world is often four and five year time horizons. The purpose of the advisory board was to give a voice in there which is not moving to those three, four year cycles. So just, just to be clear, that I understand all that. Do you think it should be provided for in the bill or not? Um, personally, again, we would have said it's tripartite. There are no, no, three but do you purposes. think the existence of an advisory board? Oh, yes, absolutely. I'm sorry, I would go bill. further and I would say that the, 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 the advisory board should exist. It should by not, statute. Should not be able to, by statute, you should okay, not be able to about it. I, I would to. also say, and it's purpose and content, the members are such that we do not drift into a point in the future, but just, for example, gets filled up with appointees from the from the existing financial services sector. Okay. That, that we'll, we'll that, that's what I mean by that. That's fine. Thanks. I've got clarity. Uh, I, uh, sure answer. Uh, yes, I think it should be in the bill uh, for the reasons that have already been outlined. Okay. I'm relaxed about it being relaxed. in the bill or not, frankly. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Once, uh,
wide range of views. Um, Jackie Bailey, did you have a follow-up question? Yes, but I'm assuming my questions are next anyway, so I was just going to seek into them, if that helps you, Convener. Well, we'll let you do that. But. Okay, fantastic. Um, the, the, can I just pick up something? Oh, I should pick up Robin McAlpine first. I have, of course, been here 20 years, so <laughs> four or five years isn't in, in, in my time frame. Um, but can I pick you up on, on a, something of substance that was raised with you by Andy Whiteman? Um, the bank is capital... I mean, you and I will remember... I think about 10, 11 announcements that the bank was coming. Um, and the reason it's, it's able to be here is because largely of financial transaction money. The strings attached to that money means that it can only be lent to the private sector. Okay, So they have started off saying that the bank um, will not fund public projects. Now, clearly your ambitions for housing and all the rest of it actually fall to the wayside unless they open that up. Is that fair? And that they're already the team are already talking to housing projects. This is public sector money which is coming in. Um, so you mean you need to clarify that with the team, as I understand it. Okay. While they are saying we're not going into local authority large scale public infrastructure lending, so they're not yet lending for the purposes of building schools or hospitals or roads. I understand okay. that they are, but I mean straightforwardly, that's where an awful lot of the initial first demand is coming from is coming from housing. Okay. And since they're going to be demand led. Um, I certainly know some people who have been fairly close to this whose biggest worries that th was that this has the potential of turning into a housing bank, which would not be a good thing. So I think housing is in there. It's, it's wider public infrastructure I don't think is yet. OK, well, we'll clarify that, because like you, I think that that would be an ambition that I think the bank should have. Um, can I come on to the mission approach? Because some of the evidence we've had to the committee suggests that that kind of mission-based um, finance approach will be complex to introduce, um, will be difficult to operate and difficult to evaluate. Do you share that view? Happy to take it. Ray Penn. Um We think it should be mission-led, but that it should start with one mission, uh, because the suggested missions in the a consultative document are very big areas, they're very important areas, and they deserve to be done properly. And trying to set up a bank uh, from scratch, or, or very nearly from scratch, to fulfil all these ambitions is going to set it up to fail. So we would prefer it to start with a single, simple mission uh, to get on top of that mission first before it expands into doing other things. Okay. And just to say, um, it, it's almost certainly legally necessary that it has a mission because, we, again, we did the original proposals in this, and quite one of the most, one of the most significant barriers you've got to go over is European Union competition laws. Mm -hmm. And one of the key ways that the bank will get around European Union con um, competition laws is to be mission driven rather than profit driven. So if it's not mission driven, it will appear profit driven and that will be more problematic in Europe. So explicitly saying it must be mission driven is part of the structural setup which enables this to take a unique place in the marketplace. So I think that's essential and necessary. My key thing is just as long as we don't mistake mission for and have you made Scotland carbon neutral yet. So what you're seeing is things that move towards the mission, not things that necessarily achieve the mission. And I do absolutely take the, let's not load it with mission, let's not expect it to do everything. But if you said that we want to invest in green energy and we want to invest in women-led enterprises and we'd like to see, so for example, one of the things that I think is a mission is exactly as we've mentioned earlier, what we call anchoring businesses in Scotland. So we get too many successful businesses that grow to a certain scale and then sell out and IP moves abroad. So one of the missions, I think, should be to anchor medium-sized growing enterprises into Scotland. So you can have these multiple missions. As long as nobody's actually pretending that the bank's supposed to achieve all of these missions in completion at any given deadline, it's OK. I think the bank should be capable of following more than one mission at a time in its lending decisions. But it's not. A, this is not the Scottish government. This is not meant to change everything all by itself. So I, I'm quite relaxed, and I think the bank should be quite relaxed in its interpretation of mission, and I really do hope that politicians give it leeway and don't attack every lending decision when, when it starts to make that, because not everyone will make every person happy. Amy Dixon? Yeah. Um, we're supportive of the mission approach. Um, however, we are slightly concerned uh, that they've not yet 
the approach has not yet been sufficiently articulated. Um, it's not very clear what a mission would look like, how long it would be, the technicality of it, what happens if you have multiple missions and they overlap or contradict one another and the lifespan of these missions and even the process for recalling them um, isn't set out in the bill or even in the policy memorandum. So I think some work needs to be done so that we all know what one another is talking about. Um, as part of that, I think the success of missions for women um, specifically d really depends on how mainstream, how gender can be mainstreamed into that process. And that's another reason that that process needs to be better articulated. Um, we recommended that there be an equality and non-discrimination element to the bill and then that the mission process should refer back to the core objectives to make sure that everything is sort of singing from the same hymn sheet um, because otherwise you end, might end up with a position where you are responding to a mission and the objectives fall to the wayside or they become concentrated on the sort of SME lending um, elements of the bank's decision making rather than on the kind of large scale challenges. Okay. I'm curious to know whether you think some of the missions should be on the face of the bill or whether you think it should be in the strategic framework to give ministers and the bank flexibility, you know, because capturing and retaining some of the big strategic core objectives um, can get lost if it's not fed right the way through. Maybe missions are, are one level removed from that. I don't know. So we're, we're grappling with what should be on the bill and what We would be, be more be. comfortable if they were in the strategic framework okay. rather than in the face of the bill. Okay. I think if missions are supposed to be uh, medium to long-term challenges but not permanent um, aspects of the bank's development work, then they probably should be within the strategic framework, but I think the process needs to be articulated. Okay. And again, this is going to be here in 100 years. I hope to goodness we are not still sitting here saying let's try and get women an equal place in the workplace. So I assume these missions will change, and I don't think that you want to be going through primary legislation to alter a bill to do that. So very broad public good mentioned in the face of the bill. What that means for any given generation, I think, will change. OK, I don't think you and I will be here in 100 years' time, it's safe to say. <laughs> One final question, convener, um, just to wrap this up. You, you talked about public good, and I don't know whether you saw me exploring with our previous panel of witnesses how they would actually assess that, because assessing social costs and benefits is, for me, at the heart of economic appraisal. Um, I wasn't convinced by the answers, I have to say, that I'm not, you know, the, the, there's no kind of discussion of substance about the Green Book approach that the Treasury takes. How are we actually going to measure some of this stuff to decide where to invest? Have you provided any information to the government? Well, can I say in, our original, in our original work, the way that we conceived of this was, once again, this is a bank which is looking in many regards like a commercial bank, and so it will become, people will be coming forward with requests for equity investment or loans. Each of these, we were suggesting, should be assessed against um, broad statements, which are in the mission statements, about what the public good is. So if providing more um, affordable, high-quality public rental housing is in the public good, then something which moves towards that um, would be meeting that goal. But the way that we suggested they should do it is to be reasonably subtle about it and say, these things give additional weighting. And I absolutely, I absolutely agree that these will conflict. And I mean, I know it'd be really nice if everything was endlessly neat and tidy, but it isn't. There will be occasions in which a really, um, a really encouraging Scottish development, developing business will be sourcing some product from some place which we would like to see being a little more ethical. And I don't think that the bank should say, well, you're a great Scottish business creating really genuinely high quality jobs, which is growing, and the thing that you're doing is broadly public good, but there's this one part of your business, and until you do X or Y, we're not going to lend to you. I think that would be a mistake. And this is why I say I think we need to have a little bit of leeway, and I think there should also be conversations with people who are lending, which is say, right, OK, we are going to give you this. Could you have a look at your procurement of this element? Because in time, we think this will be seen as being a strong negative against your enterprise. But I don't think it should then be conditionally until you go and source all ethical cotton for whatever you're doing, we're definitely not lending to you. So that's my view. And I think people need a great a degree of leeway. But we certainly thought that the best option for doing this would be to say we will we will give additional weightings to enterprises which meet certain types of these goals. For example, 
woman-led enterprise may simply say, and if it was, and this is only theoretical, but it was an absolute head-to-head, that might give you a little weighting against an alternative bid, which looked almost identical in every other way. Um, so that's the sort of, rather being really dogmatic about it, we are saying we, are in, we incline more to lend to your enterprise the more we judge it to be hitting missions rather than here's a tick box, you've crossed the threshold, you now qualify. I mean, the short answer to your question is no, we haven't given much thought to that at the moment. You'll be aware that uh, Scottish Enterprise has a methodology and the Scottish Investment Bank has a methodology for um, gauging impact. Social Investment Scotland, which you set up when you were Communities Minister 20 years ago, <laughs> has a, uh, a different methodology, but a, a, a good and thorough methodology. I think it's important that the bank consults widely on the methodology it's going to use and collects and monitors the uh, figures to give an indication of the impact of the investments that it's making. OK. Take some. Yes, um, part of the success of the bank will be the extent to which it can mainstream gender into all of its activities, not just the recipients of finance. Um, but I've talked about, about the wider impact, for example, the treating care as an infrastructure investment could um, give us. Um, that's not just a good practice, that's a legal requirement that the bank will face. Um, and data will be a key part of that. And we know that the current actors are not great at collecting, publishing and disaggregating their data. Uh, so that will be a, that will be something that the bank will have to um, work on very quickly as part of its monitoring criteria. Um, in terms of good practice, um, the Scottish government is working on a gender index as part of its um, alignment with the European uh, Gender Equality Index uh, from the European Institute of Gender Equality. Um, so it would be good if the if that piece of work could align with those metrics in some way. I think, and also uh, more generally the NPF. Thank you very much. Thank you, convener. Thank you. A very brief follow-up from Andy Whiteman and then Angela Constance. Just very brief. <coughs> On the question of the mission in Section 11, it's not intended that the mission setting process or the mission itself should be subject to a resolution of Parliament. Do you think Parliament having a role in uh, uh, um, ag agreeing that would add or, or, or hinder? In other words, do you think we should look at parliamentary scrutiny of the mission or leave it as it is to ministers? The RSE has not actually made a statement on this, but personally I would think it would enhance the credibility of the mission if they had a resolution of Parliament behind it. I tend to agree with that. These missions are not going to be changed on an annual basis. I would have thought you're looking at five-year time frames. I just cannot see that it adds an awful lot to the process of getting these missions approved if it's once every five years to take it through Parliament, they will have to align to government objectives. Inevitably, um, governments will change, strategic objectives will change. I just, I'm a fan of democracy, so if the Parliament comes behind these missions as a whole, I think that would be a good thing. I have a brief question on equalities, if there's time. Well, I, I think we'll move on to Angela Constance and see if we have time to come back to that. OK, uh, thank you, convener. I've got a few questions uh, for uh, Ms Dixon, if that's uh, all right. Um, Bearing in mind that uh, tapping into all the talents isn't just the right thing to do, it's a smart thing to do for businesses and uh, our uh, e economy. Um, but I wanted to pick up on your written, some aspects of your written submission. Um, and the impression I got, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, is that you felt that the equality impact assessment was a bit of an afterthought. <laughs> um we have pretty major concerns about the equality impact assessment for this bill, um, not least that it doesn't actually format itself like an equalities impact assessment. Um, an impact assessment should be a, a, it's a process for gender mainstreamers, as I was discussing before. It's not just a bureaucratic tick box exercise. Um, so the, the idea is that the policy is articulated, research is done, and changes are seen as a result of applying the information that is garnered. Um, we had two consultation process, an implementation plan, several announcements before the equality impact assessment was even published, and that was alongside a bill as already drafted. And there's very little evidence that that process has actually informed any aspects of the bill. We don't see any reference to equality or securing of equality or, um, intentions within the bill uh, as currently drafted. So 
I think um, there are... I should also say that the, the Equality and Fact Assessment published does not actually cover all of the protected characteristics. No. It only covers two, and even then in particularly niche strands of the bank's activities, not the wider economic Im impact that I've already discussed a little bit. So we're pretty convinced that uh, in order to meet even the basic legal requirements set out um, in the guidance from the EHRC, that this will have to be redeveloped, and not just those additional missing sections added on, but actually redoing that whole process of analysis. Okay, I mean, and obviously that's something that this committee has a, a role to raise uh, with the government as we, as we see uh, appropriate. But are you having any um, ongoing involvement uh, to try and uh, get the uh, quality impact assessment into shape? We are speaking with officials about that. Right. Okay, thank you. And you also spoke um, about um, anchoring in the bill. Um, in terms of, you know, core purpose and principles, you know, a, a, a meaningful commitment uh, to um, equality and that being uh, referenced back into the strategic framework and approach taken uh, with the, 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 the missions. I just wondered, therefore, if you could speak in a little bit more detail about where you think there's been a lack of consideration in terms of the work done uh, to design the bank, but also in terms of the bill that could be improved uh, to, to, to address matters? Yes. Um, we responded to both the government's consultations on the bill, um, head of the bill and then and, uh, the, the initial consultation back in 2017, which was before I started work at Ingenda, but that was done across the women's sector, our response to that one. Um, the, the implementation plan, as consulted, as consulted upon, had a much broader uh, intention and that sort of seemed to find its way into the consultation around the social role of the bank. That's not specifically speaking about gender, um, but there was a kind of notion that the bank's vision should be about untapped potential, responding to climate change, mm -hmm. some of the other big uh, social issues that are facing Scotland um, at this current time. So that doesn't necessarily seem to be what's come through in the bill. If you look at the objectives, I already mentioned that they're very narrowly focused on the economic aspects of the bank's work, which is, um, to some extent, understandable. But what we've lost is that wider vision and the kind of way all the different policy areas interact and should be interacting when the bank is in um, operation. So I think that the bill would be strengthened by having that purpose or that vision. Um, we've made some recommendations about how that could be further strengthened, but just that something that entrenches the kind of principle of why we're doing this, why we need something radically different, um, why we're not just returning to the same actors and making tweaks around the edges. Um, I also have made recommendations uh, relating to the objectives specifically. We've seen that where equality and non-discrimination are not included on the face of the bill, that's not translated into meaningful action. The EQIA is a pretty good example of the way in which the public sector equality duty has only worked so much. Um, and compliance, uh, Close the Gap has done some excellent work about compliance with the public sector equality duty. So having a legal duty within the bank keeps it straight at the top of everyone's mind and allows uh, for underpinning of the later development work that will have to straddle all of the different banks' activities going forward. Okay, and you touched upon earlier issues around uh, methodology and um, sometimes it's about uh, how assessments are done and uh, you know how you measure things and your understanding of what, what merit actually is. So I, I wonder if you could speak a bit more in a, a practical sense about how um, uh, diversity and merit are two sides of the same coin. They're not necessarily uh, pulling each other apart or, or polar opposites. Um, sure. I guess if you were to start from the basis that um, everything is merit-based currently, as the previous panel, I think, maybe um, hoped it was, we wouldn't be in a situation where only 28% of public executive, public executive um, directors are women. Um, that, that figure shouldn't be as low as that. That's just over a quarter. So we also have a wealth of evidence, some of which I referred to in our written submission around the ways in which equality is good uh, for growth, but the reverse is not necessarily always true. Um, I don't quite know if that answers some of your question, or, or maybe I'm not quite picking up which avenue of that you're No, I was just keen to, to give you the opportunity to uh, pick up on some of the issues um, raised earlier, and I am kind of conscious of uh, time yeah. as well. Um, 
convener. Um, but um, in the interest of equality, I am also happy to hear from the men in the panel. <laughs> I, just to say, I, I defer certainly on the legal. I, I don't have any disagreement with that. Um, I say again that in the long term, um, we've got to use the full power of government and all its agencies to tackle these things. The only thing that worries me about, I mean, this is coming from a lefty such as myself, the only thing that nerves, that makes me a little nervous if people think that this National Investment Bank can fix these problems on its own. Mm -hmm. It's not. It's a source of funding. It can fund in a way more conducive to addressing these issues. It can't fix them on their own. And I think those are perfectly reasonable suggestions about how it can do it better. But um, the only thing that has worried me in the development of this is people saying, great, now we've got a national investment bank, that's Scotland decarbonised, that's Scotland gender equal. No, we've got a source of finance which is more conducive to making these things happen, but we can't take our foot off the pedal on any of the other things we're doing in these at all. OK, thank you. Uh, Mr Perman? I wouldn't dissent from anything that Haley has said. Um, I think then uh, certainly I would agree with the point that if it is in legislation, it gets done. If it's not in legislation, it can often be overlooked. Good. Thank you. John Mason. Uh, thanks, Convener. I mean, maybe I could just press a little bit more on some of the things we've already uh, touched on, if that's all right. I mean, the balance between the objects and the missions, I mean, the object says uh, investing in inclusive and sustainable economic growth, which is pretty vague, and the Conservatives might take that as being focused on the economy and throw away the environment and the Greens might focus on the environment and throw away the economy. So I just wonder if we need more, you know, something a bit more specific in there, because we're hoping that this will go through all the uh, political cycles and be fairly consistent through all of that. Uh, and I just wonder, are you, are you really convinced that we don't need any more detail in the actual bill, Ms Dixon? I could, yeah, sorry. Um, I can just pick up on the use of inclusive growth. Use of, inclusive growth is referred to a lot, it appears in the economic strategy and other related policy frameworks. It's not actually been defined. Um, there's an OECD definition which is sometimes relied upon, but there's no um, sense yet that we have a clear direction for what we mean when we talk about inclusive growth. Do we mean everything? Do we mean everything sometimes? Do we mean gender sometimes? Do we mean placemaking sometimes? Uh, so it, in and of itself, I don't think it's sufficient to, to guide that kind of work. But can we rely then on what com comes below the bill to, to look after that, do you think? Or are you... Do you think I think we you need something more in the bill? that places the social and environmental impacts that the bank can have within the legislation. Otherwise, who's to say whether it will still be delivering those in 10 years' time? OK. And Mr McAlpin, you seemed kind of relaxed that we didn't have too much in the bill. Yeah, I mean, I mean, from my perspective, uh, a bill which, looking at the International Climate Change Committee's recommendations, which has got the word growth in it, is inevitably, you know, in 100 years, we'll not still be growing in the way that we're growing. So I could make, uh, I could take that issue up. But um, let me just put it very simply, like, we can have a very lengthy national debate about the meaning of the public good now. We can have a very lengthy public de uh, national debate about the public good later. We can do both. But this isn't an autopilot. I mean, this is the, the autopilot thing. We're not going to find a, a perfect definition of this, which will last the next 100 years, and we can press the button and then go on. So the reason that I'm relaxed about this is you're right. Different governments will have different interpretations. It will change, such as democracy. Um, I am reasonably reassured that with the governance structures and with the instruction that it's arm's length and has a long-term horizon, I am currently relaxed with what I see, that the bank has enough leeway to respond to changing political imperatives while maintaining a more long-term strategy that the bank itself will set. I would love to be able to come up with some sort of proposal which will create a set of objectives and missions which will be agreed by everybody for the next 30 years. I don't think that's realistic. I think it will be an ongoing negotiation. I think that's healthy. Um, I am caught personally more in the face of this bill just now may, may restrict what the bank does, less in the face of this bill just now may um, do less to maintain the public good benefit of the bank that I might like to see. I just don't think there's a final answer to this and I think that, like I say, it's a political negotiation for today, for tomorrow and for the day after that as well. Okay, thanks. I mean, Mr Perman, the um, Royal Society, as I understand it, is, is very strong in this um, idea that there should just be one mission to start with 
And I mean, I was asking the previous panel, you know, is it a question that the missions are all quite distinct from each other and we look at them separately, or is it more a case that they all overlap with each other? And I think the exam example was a couple of the German ones are climate change and environment, globalization and technology technological pro progress, which I would see as very much overlapping with each other. So, I mean, how strongly do you feel that there should only be one mission? Because my, my fear would be that, you know, we might concentrate on the low-carbon economy and then ignore the inclusive growth and get the balance wrong. The, uh, you're right. I mean, all those missions, they're all important. They're all um, universal. I mean, they do overlap to a tremendous amount. I think, going back to your earlier point, that um, the bill should be um, not prescriptive and that the missions should be set in the strategic framework and reviewed from time to time. But to start with a single mission, and the mission um, basically to get more investment into uh, companies and economic growth in Scotland, however we define economic growth, is the right one, but not to overlay on that the transition to the low carbon economy, the um, uh, improvement or the amelioration of the effects of a growing of an aging workforce and other missions it would be to load too much onto the bank in its early stages. So start simple and see how we get on. So, I mean, you're not actually arguing, are you, that we should just forget about these things, but more no, no. that they should just be a, kind of on the back burner or the back of our minds or something like that? Uh, I, I'm certainly not arguing that we should forget them because they're very important. I might be arguing that they're so important that we ought to give additional thought to how they could be achieved, but to expect a new institution to do all of them and all of them from day one is probably unrealistic. Okay. For point. And f my final point then would be, um, I mean, t and that's kind of touched on timescales. Are, are the timescales, do you think, realistic for setting up the bank, getting people in place, being, you know, making sure we've got a, a, the board is properly representative, all these kind of things? Well, we're not, we're not close to the detail in the way that um, your previous respondents were, but uh, Benny Higgins seemed to be fairly relaxed about the timescales, so we have to take the uh, the view that um, he's right and the bank can be set up in those times. Okay. Thanks so much. Thank you very much to our panel for coming in today. Um, I'll end this uh, session and suspend the meeting. We'll move into private session. Thank you.